I want to welcome Jan Matsuko from the Environmental Protection Agency to provide welcoming remarks from our conference co-hosts. So good morning, everybody. I am so excited to see so many folks that are actually joining us in person. Um, we're finally starting to get back to the what I would call a normal world. Um, I am humbled and I am pleased to be um, opening the 23rd annual North American Pollinator Protection Campaign International Conference. Um, as somebody with decades of experience in environmental protection in the Office of Water, I found I had a lot to learn about pollinators when I joined the Office of um, Pesticides about four and a half years ago. I knew about the importance of, um, you know, butterflies and bees, but I didn't have a good understanding of the other types of pollinators. And I certainly did not have a good understanding of the many challenges that pollinators face from climate change, pests such as the varroa mite, poor nutrition, and of course, pesticide exp exposure, just to name a few. So as such, I recognize and very much appreciate the value that NAPSI and these types of conferences bring to raising the importance and understanding of pollinators and also to promoting their health. The Pollinator Partnership and EPA have had a long-standing memorandum of understanding since 2009. The MOU, which we most recently renewed in 2020, 2021, is a key part of our ongoing efforts to protect pollinator habitats. EPA has been a member of NAPSI for since the beginning, actually since 2020, uh, it's 23 years now, and has hosted the conference several times. Our, our EPA staff have been integral members and leaders of NAPSI as well. Um, NAPSI is all about collaboration and bringing everybody to the table. Um, as such, um, uh, the, the Environmental Protection Agency obviously supports that approach. And you all know that EPA's mission is to protect the human health and human health in the environment. Um, pollinators are very important to EPA. Pollination of plants is vital to a healthy environment which in turn provides crucial national crucial natural resources for the nation, including fish and wildlife and abundant public recreational opportunities. Pollinators also play a critical role in supporting the nation's farmers and ranchers to enable sustainable and diverse agriculture, providing economic benefits and strengthening, strengthening our nation's food systems. Bees, butterflies, birds and bats, and other pollinators provide environmental benefits by facilitating plant reproduction and thriving plant communities that contribute to healthy air, water, soils, and ecosystems. The EPA, in collaboration with federal partners, continue to advance scientific knowledge and to make significant contributions to the understanding and assessment of pesticide risk to pollinators. Um, we also continue to collaborate um, with the, um, we also continue to improve strategies to reduce pesticide exposure and mitigate potential to pollinators from pesticides through ongoing registration and registration review actions, as well as collaborative partnerships. If you all have been following EPA's current, uh, current efforts to better meet our obligations under the Endangered Species Act, you know that collaboration is also one foundation of our comprehensive Endangered Species Act work plan that we released in April 22, which outlines our commitment to protecting the all endangered species, including pollinators from pesticides. The work plan and the subsequent November 22 work plan update identifies four overarching strategies and dozens of actions to expeditiously mitigate for pesticide impacts to certain species. Through these efforts, we are developing protections for listed species, including pollinators. Our Deputy Assistant Administrator um, for Pesticide Programs, Jake Lee, will be speaking about our ESA efforts as they relate to pollinators in his keynote session. I want to close by thanking all of the organizers of this event, 
including Pam Thompson and Mary Russ from the Office of Pesticide Programs. With that, um, I just hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a great day. Okay, thank you again, Jan. That was wonderful welcome from our hosts here at the EPA. And thank you to all of the employees of the EPA from security to operations and programmatic staff who have helped support our conference. We're really looking forward to the next two days together. We look forward to working together over the next two days as at such a cherished and appropriate venue. And I'd also like to thank all of you here today for devoting this time to working for a sustainable future for pollinators, people, and the planet. I'm having trouble advancing the slides, so give me a moment here. And I might need to get the AV folks to help out. Ah, here we go, okay. It's working all of a sudden. Okay, perfect. All right, and apologies for the AV uh, mishaps this morning. We're excited we got it going here. So take a step back. My name is Kelly Bills, as you just heard, and I'm the Executive Director of Pollinator Partnership and the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. Pollinator Partnership is the group that protects all pollinators. We bring all stakeholders together to do this through collaboration. Our mission is to promote the health of pollinators critical to food and ecosystems through conservation, education, and research. Pollinator Partnership is honored to have founded and coordinated the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign for the past 23 years. I would like to thank our steering committee of NAPSI, who are instrumental in the many successes of the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. I don't have time to name everyone here today, but they're a wonderful group of people, and I'm, I hope you will meet with them over the next two days and get to know them. As Laura mentioned, this is our second hybrid meeting, and I'm so grateful to the Pollinator Partnership staff and NAPSI volunteers who have helped make this event possible. Pollinator Partnership staff has grown to over 30 individuals um, all around the country, all around North America, really, to broaden the, our impact on the ground, all in support of pollinators. Pollinator Partnership has had a landmark 26th year. We have trained thousands of volunteers, enhanced over 250,000 acres of habitat, and provided free resources to an incalculable number of public and private stakeholders. An expanding program of Pollinator Partnership, which I'd like to highlight, is our Pollinator Stewardship Certification. This is spearheaded by Dr. Laura Morandon and now led by Anthony Colangelo. This program has trained over 1,000 people and certified over 500 pollinator stewards in just two years. This rigorous program provides professionals and the public the tools to support pollinators in their own work or daily lives. The Pollinator Stewardship Certification Stamp can be used to promote this training achievement. Also this year, our Climate Change and Pollinators poster is another highlight. This beautiful piece of art depicts how climate change is in our hands and the little things we do each day can support the pollinators, the little things that support planetary health and our daily lives. And now I'd like to honor those who have either passed away or have recently retired. Paul A. Oppler, and an internationally known butterfly and moth expert, author, lecturer, conservationist, passed away this year. We also lost Don Parker of the Cotton Council, a longtime sponsor and supporter of NAPSI. And we also had two NAPSI leaders retire over the past year. Ray McAllister from Crop Life of America retired earlier this year, serving for many years on the NAPSI steering committee. And also Wayne Wheeling from USDA APHIS, who retired this past year and led many of NAPSI's task forces and was key in many of its programs. Thank you to all of these wonderful people for their contributions to pollinators. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Pollinator Partnerships board members who are here today. 
Uh, we have Terry Wetzel, our board chair. Not sure where Terry is, but you will find him. He's a wonderful gentleman in the back there. And we also have uh, Ron Bittner, Dr. Ron Bittner, um, here as well on the board of directors. And we appreciate you being here and for your guidance. So um, before we head into our exciting keynote speaker session, I would like to mention NAPSI sponsors who have pro provided critical support for making this event happen. So thank you to our sponsors for your contributions to Pollinator Partnership and NAPSI's mission and to protect all pollinators across North America. You have made a really big difference. Lastly, if you are interested in posting on social media about your attendance at, at NAPSI this week, be sure to use hashtag NAPSI2023. And with that, I will turn it back over to Laura to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Kelly. So I'm pleased to introduce our first keynote presentation by Dr. Mark Moffat. Dr. Mark Moffat has been called the Indiana Jones of entomology by the National Geographic Society. Mark is a modern day explorer presently studying the stability of, of societies across animal species and humans right up to the present day. An outgrowth of his research for his fourth book, The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive, and Fall. He's one of only a handful of people to earn a doctorate under the Harvard sociobiologist and conservationist, Edward O. Wilson. And Mark has received a Lowell Thomas Medal from the Explore Explorers Club. So in-person participants, there's going to be that microphone that I mentioned that can be passed around for questions after the presentation. Virtual participants, we encourage you to submit questions through the presentation, uh, throughout the presentation through the question and answer function. We do only have a short time for questions, so please keep that in mind when framing your question, and we'll get to as many as possible. So now we'll hear from Dr. Moffat, his presentation about pollinators, stories from the field. Thanks, Dr. Moffat. Technical difficulties. I'm a jungle guy. I don't even know how to turn on a computer. Actually, my advisor, Ed Wilson, I don't think ever learned how to turn on a computer. His assistant, Kathy Horton, would print out all his emails at the end of the week, and he'd look at them over the weekend. So um, I try to stay in that kind of category of existence. But I'm told that I have a couple of videos, and they may be uh, somewhat uh, pixelated. But I'm told I look better pixelated than in person. <laughs> So I think that we're going to be okay. Uh, you can, if they look like uh, a bunch of still frames in a row, I think we're fine. If it gets more complicated than that, I'll skip them. Um, but uh, they apparently will look good for all of us that aren't here but are online. So yeah, I've been uh, not been here for a few uh, years to one of these conferences. It's great to be back and see some familiar faces. I, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the sort of classic things I did a few years ago. Forward. Where do I point? Up. Wait, that goes down. Oh, okay, down. Yep. Uh, uh. Yeah, well, I did a story on pollinators some years back, which uh, was for National Geographic and gave me an excuse to go around the world and looking for all kinds of bizarre things, things that uh, I thought would be extra cool like the fact that, um, sorry, that uh, lemurs, ring-tailed lemurs can pollinate certain kinds of plants. So that was neat to track down. I uh, got to meet some of the classic researchers there and so forth. Uh, but one of the things that really intrigued me was to try to counter this uh, problem I had when I spoke about insects people would say, what good are mosquitoes? And I found out that a mosquito was a pollinator. And I went, 
got to get that one. Got to get that one. Got to prove the mosquitoes are worth something. So I went to northern Minnesota, Ely, North Minnesota, where this fellow, Jim Brandenburg, uh, has taken many famous pictures about, of wolves. And he owns a large property up there, drove up there. And in that property, in about three square yards, was a very rare orchid the orchid that this mosquito pollinates. So on the way there, it occurred to me driving up that I couldn't photograph a mosquito pollinating an orchid and have mosquito repellent on me. So I stopped at a shop and that uh, Mr. Brandenburg recommended and bought a mosquito-proof vest. And I stood there in front of the orchids for several days waiting for the mosquitoes to do anything but come to me because they seemed rather more interested than me than the orchid. But I eventually got the picture. And there it is, a little blob of uh, pollen on its nose. The male mosquito, of course, the females are the blood suckers. Sorry. <laughs> Here's a closer up view. The only issue was the mosquito proof vest had lots of little holes in it to breathe. And I ended up having what looked like Moby Dick written in Braille on the sides of my body at the end of those days. But the mosquito was fabulous. I got these two pictures, that was enough. Here's this, a video we of me. A tiny gnat, a little midge that pollinates chocolate. I don't think this is gonna work. Plant. We heard that there was- This is another thing I was going after, a gnat that photographs at, at chocolate. An abandoned farm, this was more- ah. I'm just gonna tell you some stories separate from this. Can I get past this then? Then a, a gnat, a, a little gnat that pollinates chocolate, you probably know about it. The various experts on it said I'd never get this picture in the field. I managed to do it in five minutes. So I was very proud of this. It isn't much of a flower, this uh, gnat pollinated thing, nor is the orchid much of an orchid, as you may have noticed. Mosquitoes aren't really much on color vision. So those were kind of fun stories. There are other stories that uh, remain untold. This is the e Iwi bird, and uh, I think that's how it's pronounced, in Hawaii. It's uh, a fabulous bird, pollinator. I uh, went there uh, in Maui looking for it a little bit late in the season because I was coming in from Asia, so there were just a few flowers left. I spent days looking for the right bunch of flowers. It turns out that the only flowers that they were interested in were outside the woman's restroom. So I set up this gear here, aimed at the door of the restroom, but slightly to the left. And I tried to stream out and explain to all the uh, <clears throat> participants in the restroom facilities that it was all right. But I did get that picture. It worked out in the end. This is what it's like to be the Indiana Jones of entomology, I guess. But in this case, ornithology. So. I more recently have been working on these issues of what a society is. And uh, this in turn is an interesting question from the point of view of what makes honeybees so effective for humans. What is a society? It's a group that is able to stay together over the generations with clear memberships. And it turns out my own uh, studies uh, reveal that there are basically two ways of making a society. There are what I call individual recognition societies and anonymous societies. In individual recognition societies, everybody has to know everybody else. So chimpanzees live in communities where they literally know every individual in that group. Anyone that they don't know is a source of panic. The fact that humans can allow for strangers was a big step for us. Those were another step forward, but most Vertebrate animals, like all these, have these individual recognition societies. They have to know everybody. And those societies have to be limited to a few dozen individuals, sometimes for ecological reasons too. But definitely there's cognitive limits on how many individuals you can keep track of. So what happens with anonymous societies is that there's some source of cue that allows for strangers some way of identifying members without knowing them individually. And those for the social insects are things uh, particularly 
There are some exceptions, but particularly the scent. The scent of an ant or a honeybee is like their national flag. You have that, you're golden. And if you have that, you can keep adding individuals at no additional cost. You can suddenly have vast societies. And those are really the opportunity we have to develop the superb honeybee pollinator, these large colonies where everybody is part of the same system. So just to give an example, the ants, this is my organism. The ants can have colonies that are just a few individuals. This is a species in Costa Rica with just a, a dozen or two. They all have a scent. They don't know each other as individuals. They would think this was a waste of time. It's similar to the Borgs, if you were into that Star Trek thing. The Borgs would think, what are you wasting your time keeping track of all these individual things? Why aren't you working for the greater good? And that's basically the ant's point of view and its little brain. And But once again, if you have this kind of cue, you can grow societies that are enormous. So there, these are leafcutter ants' nests. This is one in French Guiana the size of a tennis ball court, probably several million individuals in there. And they all have that common scent. Uh, if you have it, you're golden. If you're not, if you don't, you're dead. Of course, uh, honeybees do the same thing. And this is Tom Seeley. Hi to Megan Dever if she's here. Uh, you know, honeybee societies, honeybee colonies can be 60, 80,000 individuals. They can work on a mass scale to get things done. And uh, they create a new scent every time they swarm. Part of the bee, bee colony leaves uh, with a, a second queen, forms a separate unit. And over the days that follow and weeks, it gains its own scent and becomes separated from the original colony in terms of its identity as a group. And these, you know, functioning at this level, you can have all kinds of things happen. As you probably know, how many flowers do you have to visit to create a pound of honey? Everybody knows that. Okay, Tom Seeley there from Cornell says uh, a couple million at least. And uh, the combined flying time to forage throughout the year for one colony is, uh, or distance, adding up all those foraging trips would pre probably take the bees around the world several hundred times around the circumference of the world from one colony. So the scale of operations becomes an important contributor to the success of bees and certainly the reason honeybees have become essential for us for agriculture. I had a lot of fun visiting a research group in Germany that built a robot bee that uses the dance language. Here it is here. They were guiding it to different places. It was in the dry season. So it was in a little shed surrounded by a vast area of desolation. No plants were growing in this season. And uh, everybody was working very hard. In fact, very long days and very hot days. And I remember uh, with this bee, robot bee, you know, indicating which person they should, the bees should all fly to that day. And uh, in the distance, I could remember one of the graduate students sort of leaning on his chair and then topple over and fall to the ground. He had to be rehydrated. These were long days with these robot honeybees, but it worked. So this kind of mass communication certainly is a reason again for the success of bees operating on a big scale. And, uh, you know, I was a student of Ed Wilson. Here I am giving him a, an award from the Explorers Club that was based on the photograph you see here. And uh, he was, you know, an ant man. Pollination came up every once in a while, but it was mostly about the ants. And we ju he just died last December. So about half his students were able to get together in, uh, up in New England. I don't know if you'd recognize anyone here. You probably recognize the guy with the red suspenders. That's Roger Swain. He was the host of the Victory Garden. That's an unexpected twist from being a PhD student at Harvard. And Scott Miller, uh, at top row, second to the right end there, is the chief scientist here at the Smithsonian. He had, had, had quite a diversity of students uh, across Asia, uh, African-Americans, different parts of Latin America, 
in a department that was almost all white males. He had several women, some of which didn't make it here, including uh, Gabriela Chavara, who's the head researcher at uh, the Denver Science Museum, studied uh, pollination. Anyway, ants also count as pollinators. They are not the best. They're not the swiftest. But at high elevations in Colorado, for example, where it might be a little difficult for a bee to fly or a hummingbird to hang out, the ants take over the job. And this is one on an alpine forget-me-not. Um, of course, Ed was known for his work on biophilia. And uh, I think biophilia is what I come to when I think about pollination, because the pollination really has been a central point in the human connection with nature for a long time. And I have a second video here. I'm going to see if this one, which just has still images, might actually work. This is something I did for Look 3, a, a, bio, a uh, photography. I'm Mark Moffat. I'm an ecologist who loves to find challenging stories that have not been photographed before. Now pollinators, which are animals that carry pollen from one plant to the next and fertilize their flowers, they tend to be commonplace and easy photographic subjects. But there's an urgency to the story of pollinators because of the population decline of these animal species, some of which help create much of our food supply. So I'm a member of a group called the Pollinator Partnership that educates people about this issue, which is why I proposed the story for National Geographic magazine. My goal was to get beyond some of the cliché animals visiting plants, though some of the clichés are fun, like this long-tongued hawk moth pollinating a long-throated flower. Of course, the classic pollinator is the honeybee, a species that's been taken around the world by humans. Their populations have been collapsing because of a number of stresses, including these parasitic mites that ride around on the bees. Many other wasps and bees are pollinators, though, including other social species that use high-energy nectar to fuel their societies, such as this fairy bee, shown carrying out a bit of compacted pollen trash from its nest in Panama. Other bees are solitary, like this orchid bee that scrapes away at the orchid flower petals to remove an elixir that it uses as a sexual perfume to attract the ladies. My favorite bee pollinator is the sweat bee that buzz pollinates the deadly nightshade plants of Arizona. The bee grabs the male parts of the plant and stimulates those male parts by vibrating vigorously till a white sticky substance shoots all over the bee. That stuff is the pollen. To get the most primitive pollinator, I visited the White House. There, the president chef Sam Cass was helping a school class collect garden plants, many of which require yes. pollinators. On the White House grounds are magnolia trees planted by Andrew Jackson. Magnolias are visited by beetles, the original pollinators back in the time of the dinosaur. The Geico gecko does not sell car insurance. It's a pollinator. Unfortunately, at the time I visited Mauritius, the only flowers happened to be high up in the trees. I managed to balance myself standing upright on the uppermost rung of a ladder for two days under a blazing 100 degree sun until I got this image of a gecko sipping nectar. It's one inch from my camera lens. As I was about to say, this is, was for a, a photo, a big photo exhibit in, uh, in Charlottesville uh, called Look 3 a few years ago. And uh, I, uh, you know, biodiversity is what it's all about. We are kind of the cornerstone of biodiversity. You can sell it through pandas. You can sell it through pollinators. You can get people excited about certain kinds of issues. And I think this is a core one. For Ed Wilson, uh, I was able to bring him to Panama, and I uh, we talked about biodiversity and things high up in the trees as we climbed around looking for uh, different kinds of species, including things like fig wasps, which are, of course, fabulous. This is at BCI. Uh, across the way there, you see 
uh, John Tobin, uh, his student, and uh, I basically went uh, and exchanged places with John Tobin to take this picture, picture I showed you before, uh, and I was climbing the tree and suddenly I was thrown upside down and the my harness was escaping up my legs, which meant I was about to fall to the ground. So I grabbed my harness and pull myself up and, and right myself again. And Ed is screaming over at me, what's going on? Are you okay? And I say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I pull it together and snap it back together. And I realized my harness has a quick release feature. Do not get a harness with quick release feature <laughs> as part of its design. So to me, one of the really interesting things as a component of all this is the structure of the world, the structure of something like a rainforest, the structure of a, a kelp forest. All these communities have structures that are very complex. And of course, in the rainforest, we speak of the overstory and understory. And if you look here, for example, between the overstory and understory is a open gap. It's sort of a, a black space going through here. And all different species are using these spaces and layers in different ways, including the pollinators, as David Rubick has shown for bees. My favorite for this case is the bats that can maneuver between the big bats, the fruit bats that can maneuver between the layers and those openings between the layers. And therefore, the flowers that they have to pollinate have to be able to extend down into those openings between the layers so you get different kinds of plants like this with pendulous flowers that are quite fabulous. This is a picture from the Fogdens. So this tapestry extends for a vast distance and includes thousands of tree species. My favorite example of this, I don't know how many of you have heard of this, are the dipterocarps. And there are dozens of species in places like Borneo, Southeast Asia generally. And those species have millions of flowers each and they all come into flower, simul uh, each species come into flower simultaneously at the exact same time for a few days. And then their flowers die and the next species flowers and the next species, it's a sequence across all of Borneo. And what can pollinate these huge numbers of flowers what's well, something called the thrips. The thrips, here's, here's one of the dipterocarps, they're giant trees. The thrips are minute insects that breed really fast and they just succeed unlike the honeybee, which has this methodical way of doing things with its large colonies. The thrips, the thrips succeed through sheer reproductive explosiveness with clouds of these insects moving through the forest and then changing from one species of dipterocarp tree to the next. So it's this kind of thing that I think is important in terms of our understanding of pollination too, that the health of not only humans, but the very fabric of the natural world depends on pollinators. Thanks so much. Oh, that's there. the one. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, but you have to stay up here. <laughs> We're not done with you yet. Thank you so much, Dr. Amal. Oh, yeah. That was absolutely incredible, and the images are uh, just stunning. So we have time for uh, maybe one or two questions. We'll take one from the room first. Okay, Zach. Yes, your and question is? The question, well, yeah, it can be an ant question. So I used to have a friend that studied uh, contact hammers in Colombia, and she loved to sell them as pollinators. And I would always bicker. What is a pollinator? That's, the, that's, that's my question right there. So I used to bicker with this primatologist about whether or not her focal species was a pollinator. And I said, have you proven that they have resulted in plant reproduction? And I'm just curious to hear your thoughts or philosophies about how much work needs to go in to show that you know, an interaction with the plant causes pollination. Can, can visitation, I'm just, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, in each case, you gotta look at the species, see what visits it. And uh, there are things that are extremely ineffective that can still transfer pollen. And if that's the only thing there, 
you can probably call it a pollinator, and that's basically the case for the ring-tailed lemur. It's a very sloppy thing. It uh, pollinates by like smashing the flowers to bits and chomping them down. But then again, that's the way it all started, right? The original pollinators were those uh, Jurassic and pre-Jurassic beetles that were chomping on pollen and probably eating the flowers more than they were helping. But still, they got the whole process going. And then uh, you can have much more effective pollinators. And when that happens, the darn beetles just look like a menace to the whole system. But so it depends on the species, I guess. And I've got a question from online. Um, so for Dr. Moffat, what species of mosquito and orchid were those? And can you maybe speak in the microphone just to make sure that our online oh, folks can hear your responses too? Thank you. All right, well, you know, uh, I'm really not into my species of mosquitoes and orchids, so I don't have those handy. Just imagine a word with a lot of syllab syllables and double it. <laughs> that is what we're talking about. That's how important this orchid is. It's very rare. In fact, it's so top secret that I'm not allowed to tell you what species it is. That's my new theory. <laughs> okay, is there more comment online, Amber? If, if we have time, there is one more. Um, so, uh, Dr. Moffat, do you know what uh, complexes or chemicals make up the scents found in an ant or honeybee colonies, which allow for those anonymous societies? There are a lot of hydrocarbons. It's a particular mix of hydrocarbons, which is how basically mostly the cells of our body identify who belongs and who doesn't, and the way blood cells attack things that don't based on hydrocarbon cues on their, the surfaces of the cells. So it's like another layer up, and those uh, are very specific, but they're also quite uh, easily relearned. So over the life of a honeybee colony or an ant colony, they can adjust their perception of who belongs and who doesn't. It's a lot more learning going on than you might think. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Moffitt. I'll take that too. You. Oh, I, I need this. <laughs> we have a present for you here, Dr. Moffitt. <laughs> Free chocolates for everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Communal. Great. Okay, so now for our next presentation, I'm pleased to introduce Jake Lee. Jake Lee is the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Pesticide Programs within EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, where he works on a wide variety of pesticide issues. One of Jake's priorities is to help EPA achieve its endangered species protection goals related to pesticide decisions. Immediately before joining EPA, Jake worked for over a decade in the nonprofit sector on natural resource conservation and chemical regulatory issues. And now we'll hear Mr. Jake Lee's presentation about protecting pollinators from pesticides through the Endangered Species Act. Welcome, Jake. Um, th thank you so much. And it's, it's great to be here. Just wanna make sure the slides are gonna be queued up soon. Oh, okay. Got it. Slight lag. Okay. Great. Um, great. Well, um, good morning, everyone. And it's really an honor to be here. Um, uh, it's really hard to follow Dr. Moffitt's um, stories and pictures, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. And I thought those stories really underscored for me why it's so important to protect um, these pollinators, protect the evolutionary process that gives rise to all of these critters. And I think we're actually going to go from his globe trotting stories to what we're doing literally in this building, right, uh, on the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth floor, uh, to actually protect some of these pollinators. And I want to under, um, actually focus my presentation on what we're doing under the U.S. Endangered Species Act um, to make progress in protecting, in particular, federally endangered and threatened species, um, but also you know, pollinators that benefit from reduced exposure, right, to wetlands and other natural habitats. Uh, I think, as you all know, not all endangered species are pollinators, and certainly not all pollinators are endangered species. But there is a really good overlap in that Venn diagram. And I think a lot of the things that we're trying to do to reduce exposure to endangered species 
again, are also going to um, protect pollinators more generally. So I'm really excited about that work. Before I get started, I, I really need to give a big shout out to Jan Matusko um, and her entire team in the Environmental Fate and Effects Division. Um, Pam Thompson is here as well. Um, and all the other divisions in our pesticide office, because uh, I'll say this without exaggeration. I have been working on this issue for over 15 years, um, often in a pass from the outside, pushing the agency, suing actually our office when I worked at Defenders of Wildlife to try to get these protections in place. And I think our office has done a complete 180 on this issue and really, really taking the obligations to protect endangered species really seriously. And that is such an important milestone in where we are going as an agency, and I think aligns perfectly with you know why we are all here today, right? So let me get started and give you a little bit of background as to how we got into this space. I, I know many of you are probably familiar with uh, our challenges over the years in complying with the Endangered Species Act, but not everyone is. So just to set the backdrop, um, the Endangered Species Act is about as old as EPA, and during that time, uh, we most of our decisions on pesticides have not been fully compliant with the Endangered Species Act. Uh, it is a very, very difficult uh, problem to try to solve because there are so many pesticide active ingredients out there, and there are so many endangered species in just the U.S., right? So currently, there are over 1,600 federally listed species in the U.S. So you imagine all of these permutations. Every endangered species, all of these pesticides, all of these possible uses, uh, different rates of uses, it is an incredibly, incredibly difficult uh, problem to try to crack. And that's one reason it's been so hard historically to come into compliance to get these protections in place. And starting a few years ago, we, we really thought, okay, we, we have to take this seriously, we have to solve this problem, and we have to get some protections in place as soon as possible, even if they are not perfect, even if they don't get across the finish line, we need to move ourselves towards compliance and we need to actually protect the species on the ground. And uh, the actual legal trigger is that under the federal pesticide law, that the acronym is FIFRA, um, when we register a new pesticide or when we reevaluate an existing pesticide every 15 years, that triggers the Endangered Species Act, including a review with our federal wildlife agencies and, if needed, protections to reduce exposure to federally endangered species. Um, this slide just gives you a little sampling of how the courts have not been happy with us. Um, we uh, don't have good defenses on the merits to not fully complying with the Endangered Species Act anymore. These are decisions on from the last year and a half from federal appeals courts um, that have completely lost their patience with our office in terms of um, not fully complying with the ESA. So this is a really, really, really important priority for our office. And so what we did, as Jan mentioned earlier, is in April of last year, we developed our first comprehensive roadmap in the agency's history for how we want to get into full compliance with the Endangered Species Act. It's going to take a number of years, right? We, we can't solve this problem. We can't solve 40 years of problems overnight, but we're really committed to adopting protections that are directionally correct uh, and that are meaningful on the ground. So that's what this work plan sort of lays out. And one of the most important things it lays out is, as I've been mentioning, early mitigation, trying to adopt protections for listed species, including pollinators, well before the Endangered Species Act process is complete. Because right now, that process takes anywhere from four to 12 years per chemical to go through the full ESA consultation process. We don't have four to 12 years to wait for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chemicals. So this is one thing that we're doing that we've never done before, which is under our federal pesticide law, we're actually adopting early protections for endangered species that we think uh, move in the right direction of where we eventually need to be under the Endangered Species Act while we await the resources, while we await a more efficient process to actually come into full compliance sooner. So I'm really, really excited about this because this is what's actually leading to some protections through pesticide labels that you are actually going to start seeing really soon. So that brings me to the question of what are the actual protections I'm talking about, right? This can seem sort of very vague or abstract, 
Um, let me just give a few examples. And, and there's two main routes of pesticide exposure that we're really focused on. The first one is what we call spray drift. So imagine someone spraying pesticides in the air and there's wind, right, that carries those droplets into uh, sensitive habitat. That's what we really want to reduce. Um, that's going to help pollinators. That's going to help listed species. It's going to help wildlife in general. And so some examples of the types of protections that we're now requiring our labels include larger droplet sizes so that those droplets fall to the ground sooner rather than get suspended in the air and, and carried further. Um, restrictions on when the pesticide can be sprayed based on wind speed as well as, well as wind direction. Um, limits on the height of the sprayer, right? So the, the closer it is to the ground, the less likely that that pesticide is going to drift. And um, buffers for aquatic and sensitive wildlife habitat. So these, this is just a sampling of the things that we are now adopting more and more into our pesticide decisions. Um, uh, the other route of exposure we're really focused on is reducing pesticide runoff. So you can imagine if there's a storm or a big rain event, especially on a field that's sloping, you, you can get uh, quite a bit of pesticides that are carried off the field into a wetland or other species habitat. We want to try to reduce that, right? Uh, and it's also of great interest to the farmers and pesticide users because pesticides are expensive. And really, I haven't met a single person who wants pesticides drifting off the field into species habitat in the first place. So I, I actually think we're working towards common goals here. And what we are trying to do at EPA is to identify protections that are actually practical for farmers and other pesticide users to implement, right? Because if they're not practical, um, people realistically are, pr are probably not going to implement them um, to the full degree. So, so there's this really important balancing act between measures that are actually effective to protect wildlife, but are also doable both economically and, and as a practical matter for pesticide users. Uh, and as I said, Jan and other divisions uh, at, at uh, the pesticides office are just working around the clock, engaging with stakeholders to figure out what is that balance, right? What are these practical measures that are efficacious and actually workable on the ground? So what we're doing in terms of pesticide runoff is building a larger and larger menu of protections that farmers and others can pick from. And I've offered a few examples here, uh, vegetative filter strips, um, cover crops, riparian buffers, retention ponds, um, strip cropping, mulching. Actually, these are all things that um, a lot of uh, farmers should already be familiar with, right? This is not reinventing the wheel. And that's a really important thing, right? We want to try to focus on measures that people um, are already doing or are familiar with so that they can be incorporated as soon as possible. And we're also working with USDA on a lot of that. Um, another example of, of some of these um, measures that we're putting onto statements are, uh, for some pesticides, pollinator statements. So, so these are requirements um, or, or restrictions on applying pesticides in certain times of the day to reduce exposure to bees. Okay, next I want to talk about where, how do we convey these new protections that we're adopting? There's really two ways. The first way you might be familiar with, if you go to a Home Depot or, or anywhere and you pick up a, 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 a you know, bottle of pesticide, you'll see oftentimes in very, very small font, right? Uh, all of the restrictions um, on the use of those pesticides. Um, some of those pesticide labels can be over 150 pages long. Um, and so that can really complicate, right? The, the ability to identify, okay, where in a country um, are there restrictions on applying a pesticide to protect endangered species? And so that's why more and more we are supplementing what appears on a physical label with an online web-based um, approach to protecting endangered species. And the reason is that, as many of you know, a lot of endangered species occur in only parts of a county, right? And we don't want to over-regulate by uh, restricting pesticides in areas that the species are not present uh, under the Endangered Species Act. And we're also not gonna fit hundreds of maps onto a pesticide label. So the best way to convey those location-specific restrictions is through this online system called Bulletin's Live 2, or BLT. And it's basically GIS files 
that indicate, okay, where are there restrictions at what times of the year uh, and for, for what particular pesticides. And so this is one way we can try to thread a needle of, again, measures that are protective of endangered species, but that are palatable uh, and workable for farmers and other pesticide users. And this is how we can get geographically specific. So we're, we're going to be doing more and more of both. The traditional restrictions on labels and then more things that appear on bulletins live. Um, this is a really exciting pilot project we have going on right now that is one example of how we're conveying these geographically specific pesticide um, restrictions. So this pilot is called the Vulnerable Species Pilot, and it's one that we're working in collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on. What we've done is propose 27 federally listed species, including several pollinator species that you see on the left-hand side here, that we deem to be particularly vulnerable to pesticides and that are conducive to geographically specific uh, protections. We started with these 27 species because we, you know, this is still a learning experience for everyone involved in this, right? Like I said, we hadn't done much in 40 years and now we are running really, really fast to try to get these protections in place. And we're all still learning, you know, what is this best way to try to identify protections that are geographically specific, engage with pesticide registrants, engage with pesticide users, and, and really sort of, you know, balance this very difficult act. So this pilot project is a great way for us to um, take lessons learned. We proposed it earlier this year. We got over 10,000 public comments, and now we are working to uh, finalize, refine this approach, and hope to actually um, give an update later this year. So this is really exciting because it will result in real world protections for very specific species that I think really need some protections. Okay, so that's sort of what are the protections. L let me talk a bit about which pesticides uh, we're, we're sort of talking about here. This is uh, a slide uh, about to convey actually our workload. Um, you don't have to memorize any of these chemicals here. The, the point here is that these are chemicals for which we have um, court enforceable deadlines uh, to complete some portion of our Endangered Species Act analysis. And w these um, basically are commitments through the years 2030. And this is far less than 5% of all of the pesticide decisions that we need to bring into compliance with the Endangered Species Act during this time. So even if we did all of this, and this basically maximum this is this will take up all of our resources based on our current process. We still have over 95% of, of our decisions that we haven't brought into compliance yet um, in the next 10 years. So we really need to figure out more efficient ways to actually come into compliance. And this is foreshadowing some work that I'm going to talk about next. But I, I just want to sort of put some numbers up on the screen to show you um, the amount of work in our office is is really monumental at this point. So where do we start with trying to, to bring pesticides into compliance? Well, um, in January of 2022, um, we announced the first ever policy of this type where we basically said we are not registering any more conventional pesticide active ingredients unless we can determine that there is a way to bring them into compliance with the Endangered Species Act. It sounds very simple, right? It basically just says, we're going to comply with the Endangered Species Act for this set of chemicals. But we've never actually said that as an agency. Uh, and so this, I, I think of as when you're 10 feet deep in a hole, stop digging, right? And so this is a policy to stop digging a deeper hole for us. Uh, and it's one that we've been implementing. We now have new pesticide active ingredients that we're registering with protections that the registrants have agreed to um, that I think are meaningful. Uh, for endangered species. So this was really exciting. And we will continue to implement this for all new conventional pesticide active ingredients that go through our process. Um, next is actually, this is one that was uh, under a sort of uh, litigation previously. This is a new active ingredient insecticide. And I put this up there because it, it shows what we're actually doing right now. We revise labels with endangered species protections in just September of this year. And that includes some of the things I talked about earlier, the medium to coarse spray droplets, um, buffers from you know, water areas, uh, buffers when you 
what we call ear blast, which is uh, spla um, blast uh, the pesticides into the ear um, to get on vegetation. Um, and then the use of those geographically specific bulletins for 18 listed species. So for 18 listed species, we decided we need the more tailored protections. Okay, here's another example. Um, it's uh, insecticide widely used called malathion. Um, and we implemented protections for Fish and Wildlife Service uh, regulated species in August of this year. And same thing, um, buffers to minimize spray drift, um, restrictions um, on wind speed and timing, um, pollinator best management practices, um, and actually prohibition of spraying in certain areas that are really important for endangered species. Um, and then I've talked thus far about very specific pesticide decisions. I want to touch on something that's actually completely new and very exciting for our office, which is, as is, is, is you saw from that slide earlier of all of those 50 plus chemicals, we can't do this chemical by chemical. It will literally take us 100 years to get through our current list of chemicals. And the courts, as you saw from my second slide, are not going to give us 100 years to figure this one out. So that's why we are adopting um, approaches for entire classes of pesticides. What we're starting first with is all herbicides that are used in agriculture. And what we're trying to do with this framework that's currently out for public comment is to identify what are the mitigation measures that we need for herbicides such that when we actually make a decision under the federal pesticide law, we already have these mitigations identified and they're ready to go. And that's also important for the pesticide users because this will help standardize mitigations so that they're consistent across different types of pesticides. So really excited about this one. It's out for public comment, um, and that public comment period ends um, later this month. And then last thing I'll mention is something that's really exciting uh, for me, actually, which is Hawaii, as many of you know, ha has the most endangered species of any state in the nation. Um, we are working with Fish and Wildlife Service and others to develop a whole approach for Hawaii, where the goal is actually to adopt protections for agriculture and other major uses of pesticides for Hawaii. This is one way we're hoping to tackle over 400 species, 400 listed species in Hawaii. And this will also have spillover benefits, I think, for a lot of um, uh, non-listed pollinator species. Um, so more to come on this um, likely next year. And with that, let me, I think I'm, I'm actually well out of time. So thank you. I hope this was interesting and happy to take a few questions. We have a number of questions. Ron. Bee biologist, also a farmer. Oh, I was a bee biologist, but I'm also a farmer. Farmers are a tough nut to crack, because all my friends are farmers out there. What are you doing to follow through to see if you're gaining ground? Because I'm seeing more grants coming out where they're actually adding a social survey to, to get farmers to understand or see understand the farmer perspective are, are you doing those types of things too because you got to get buy-in somehow from all of this yeah so um uh, just two, two brief answers to that question one is that um, these protections are federally required once they're on a label um so they're enforceable under our federal uh pesticide law as well as the endangered species act um, but that doesn't necessarily answer the question of how do we raise awareness right how do we ensure that people actually know these things are are on labels and how to implement them. So we're also doing a bunch of outreach, uh, working with pesticide users, with agriculture, working with USDA um, on raising awareness, for example, about the Bulletin's live system, raising awareness about these new measures. And also the public comment process is really, really important. I, I think I have a meeting every single week with someone in agriculture. Um, sometimes it's a heads up, this is what we're thinking, what do you think about this? So there's a lot of upfront engagement that our office does to try to make sure that what we're proposing and what we finalize is workable as much as possible. Uh, there was one more back here, and then we'll go to the uh, online people. Is there one back here? Yes. And sorry, I don't mean to vote. And I'll, I'll also stick around afterwards for lunch, so happy to continue chatting. Yeah. Well, I, I hesitated because I feel like um, you answered a little bit of the question, but I was thinking more so on the on the end of companies and how that would be enforced for com for different for industry um, for any of this. Um, uh, the, so the enforcement, yeah, I'll just quickly answer. 
So um, state, um, the states are actually the primary uh, enforcement uh, arm uh, for these federal pesticide labels, and, and EPA can step in afterwards. But really, it's the states, and we also work a lot with states um, uh, to try to also get them up to speed on the things that we're doing. Thank you. And I know there's a whole bunch from over here, so I think we'll take one more from this side and then we'll go to uh, the virtual Is there any, anybody over there? Yeah. Thank you. Um, actually, it's two questions. Um, one is, can you talk a little bit more about the Hawaii example? Because I'm really curious about that coming from the Pacific region of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. And then the second is, back to the farmer question, do you work with the soil and water conservation districts um, to get your information out? Yep. So on the first one, I'm happy to chat a bit more offline about uh, actually Hawaii, and, and you're of course in the perfect region for us to you know continue engaging on that. So it's currently still a work in progress, but our goal is to try to adopt protections that we think we know how to identify right now for as many Hawaii species that are affected by pesticides as possible, right? So, so that's sort of my five second sort of pitch for what we're trying to accomplish. And trying to also figure out what's already being done on the ground, for example, by golf courses, by farmers and others, that may be a springboard for us to adopt any additional protection. So there's a lot of like stakeholder engagement as part of that process. Um, in terms of the soil and conservation districts, uh, yes, to some degree, I, I think not as much as we need to do. So that's also a sort of a work in progress and certainly welcome discussions on better ways to go about doing that. All right, thank you. Yes, we have a number of questions online and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, so uh, does the EPA uh, also have to take into account synergistic effects between pesticides to become compliant with the ESA? Um, in terms of ESA compliance, uh, actually Jan is probably best suited to answer that question. I think we do look at additive and synergistic uh, effects to some degree, right? But I, my, my understanding is that science continues to evolve and we don't necessarily have ecotox data on every listed species. So we're looking at surrogate species to, to identify, you know, whether it's synergistic or additive. Um, certainly welcome, uh, you fed others if you want to chime in. So most of you are probably aware that our current process, really, we look at the active ingredient that's in front of us, right? Um, it, this is a this is a an issue that folks have brought up a lot. What we do is consistent with what the other international organizations that are looking at pesticides do as well. Um, what I can tell you is that um, you know there's a lot of people will apply for patents where they'll say there's a synergistic effect. What they mean is something very different than what. We mean when we're looking at pesticides. Having said that, um, the registrants are collecting any information on this patents, providing it to us, doing some analysis for, for us so that we can, at least for the new AIs, um, try to try to um, look at the available, available data to see if there is um, any synergism going on there. And if so, um, we, we deal with that appropriately. Um, but Jake is right too. Um, there's not a lot of data. <laughs> there's a lot of pesticides. There's a lot of pesticide products, and there's not a lot of data on, on this. And so this is an area that um, internationally, um, I think folks struggle with to some extent. Yep. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? I think we're out of time right. right now, but uh, Jake will be around. So yeah, feel free to ask questions. Great. OK, thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jake. That was so informative and interesting. Okay, for our last uh, keynote speaker before lunch, we have Dr. Diana Cox Foster. Dr. Diana Cox Foster is a research leader and entomologist at USDA ARS PWA Pollinating Insects Research Unit in Logan, Utah. Diana's research focuses on bees and their interactions with pathogens and stressors parasites and pesticide exposure. So now we'll hear from Dr. Cox Foster's, we'll hear about Dr. Cox Foster's research on interactions among bee species. 
How do honeybees interact with other species of bees? A three-year study. So thank you for the invitation to speak. And this is a study that uh, it's taken a team to do this work. So I only get a little bit of the credit. Credit goes to my co-PIs, Jonathan Koch, Lindsay McCabe, Byron Love, Kelsey Graham, and Craig Hunsinger within our team. This was an externally funded study. We were sought out by stakeholders and asked if we would do this study. And it it is a hot button issue. So. We agreed to do it with the understanding that we would do rigorous, unbiased science and that we were free to publish our research no matter what our findings were. And you'll become clear why that was important. This was funded by Project APISM and Costco Foods, which we were very grateful because the significant funding. We also had a collaborator, a cooperator, Darren Cox of Cox Honey in, in Logan is where his home base is. Okay. And it took a team, an army, to do this. We had a, a large workforce to do our very complicated study, as I'll show you, to give each of those people credit. The ones in blue are actual technicians that offer up their expertise. And the ones in red were team leaders for field work in later studies. So to take it in where we're going, as you've heard, and as you know, there are a lot of different bee species in the world, over 20,000. In North America, we have over 4,000 different bee species. And as you've heard already, these are keystone species for both food security and environmental quality. So protecting their health, which is what we're all here, and their survivorship is the key to this. And as you may know, these are not evenly distributed across the U.S. Different species or have different very specific habitats. You see that the diversity hotspot is in the American Southwest. This is also where many of the federal lands are located, as well as other agricultural centers there. And as Dr. Moffitt and Jake have mentioned today, the bees have been under a great stress. Currently, the annual loss rate of honeybee colonies exceeds 40%. And the only reason you're not hearing more about that is because beekeepers, the companies, work extremely hard to build up the colony numbers and keep it going. Also, we know that there are other bees, those on the endangered species list that have been added, and those under consideration by Fish and Wildlife to be added to the species list, where we're seeing this decrease. We, the research, way back since colony collapse disorder, which I got to be part of, we now know from global researchers that there's the four Ps we call them. Pesticides, pathogens, parasites, and poor nutrition. Poor nutrition basically translate into not enough flowers. And I put another petal or overlying thing over this. Climate is an impactor. We know now that climate does interact with flowers interacts with quality of the pollen that the plants produce and um, can create issues. And I'll show you some of those. We have this major need now that we recognize at USDA has created a, uh, I lost it here, but we have a major project across USDA on forage and habitat and nutrition for bees. That we need more bee pasture for all the bees i.e. the better fed you are, the better you can withstand other stressors. That holds true for us, it holds true for the bees. So what are these bees? So among our 4,000 species, the majority are solitary bees. You have to think of these as being single moms. So they're the ones who, each female bee is the one who creates her nest, either in cavities above ground or in down in the ground nest cavity or nest ground nesting bees. These bees are active depending on the species at different points in time across the season. 
and they may be associated with different plants. So each female goes out, she mates first, she goes out and collects pollen and nectar, creates a pollen provision. So in the top left, that little brown ball there is this pollen provision and she lays an egg on it and then seals that off. That's her whole contact with her offspring. Those bees develop and grow up and they normally overwinter as adults go through hibernation and then come out at the appropriate time the next year. Bumblebees over on the right here, the queen that was an offspring the previous year, she is overwintering, comes out in the spring. She's also a single mom for a little bit. She gathers pollen and nectar, grows up worker bees. They take over for her. She becomes a sole reproductive. Late in the season, she's producing queens and drones. Those queens then mate find a place to hibernate and repeat the cycle again. Honeybees at the bottom here are very different. Honeybees were brought to United or to North America over 500 years ago by the Spanish and the Jesuit priests. Jesuit priests making use of the bees for wax in the church, candles in the church, also brought in by the colonists. They've been here for quite a while. The number of colonies in the United States has been extremely high in the early 1900s and declining. We're at the lowest level in colony numbers right now, but it seems to be stable, mainly through the hard effort of beekeepers. You have to think of a honeybee colony as a village. As this Borg, as uh, Mark Moffat referred to, the social mind there, we need all the individuals within that colony to maintain the temperature. So you may have 40 to 68,000, I'd say it's more like 40,000 these days with our bee health of individuals there, but only a proportion of them are out foraging at a time, a very small amount. The others are in taking care of the colony. The queen is the mother of all. If you have a healthy queen that keeps your colony going and then the workers emerge. So the key element that links all these different kinds of bees is this need for pollen and, and nectar. That's what keeps them going. So this is a picture here. This is something that would commonly be seen many years ago before climate change started exerting itself. In the West right now, we have existing history of droughts that have been impacting Western states. So this is a rare picture here in, in Cache County in Utah, we saw this this year, but uh, it probably won't be happening again next year. So you see lots of flowers, lots of food for everybody. So there has been a, an issue brewing and it's gotten to where it's getting into legislative and regulatory actions where honeybees are being perceived as the bad guy out there that um, there's papers coming out of Europe in particular talking about competition between bee species and honeybees having a negative impact. Honeybees in Europe are a native bee. <laughs> and in, I would put forward that it's not competition, it's i.e. carrying capacity. How much food do you have? So I stand be between you and lunch back here. If there were only 10 sandwiches back there, for this number of people, we would greatly exceed carrying capacity. There wouldn't be enough food. We would be competing for each other to get to that. So I think we have to look at uh, flowers in the environment, like this plate of flowers here, as having a limit on how many bees can be supported. You have your endemic bees, but you may also have managed apiary, honeybee apiary, or insect livestock, that be brought in. And how many flowers there are is going to be dependent upon many things, weather condition, moisture, temperature. There's also other animals out there that want to eat those plants. So grazing herbivores, either natural animals, herbivores in environment like deer and elk, but you may also have managed livestock being introduced. Within our bees, we also have differences in specialist bees who have a very tight linkage to the plants that they pollinate versus more generalized bees. So understanding all those is important. So we uh, set out to ask this question and we consulted with people across the spectrum, experts, to ask about the, our experimental design and how we could improve it. 
We asked the question about reproduction and colony growth, i.e. fitness. How did that work when you bring the different bees together, different species? Do we see changes in their foraging behavior, how they interact with the plants in terms of doing pollination? And then lastly, pathogen transfer. That's where I got my cutting teeth on pathogens and bees. And we showed but when I was at Penn State that many of the pathogens were spread by pollen. So we tackled this here. We did two types of experiments. One was in cages where we can contain things and we could experimentally manipulate it. We wanted to actually generate competition. So we knew what it looked like, what symptoms and what traits could we follow and look for there. So we, our lab, why people reached out to us is we have a lot of expertise, not myself, but the other team members in managing bumblebees. So getting queens, wild caught queens to start a new colony that we can then follow, as well as solitary bees that we've been working with for many years and honeybees. So we're able to bring the three different types of bees together in a controlled environment and also look in the cages at how they're interacting with the flowers, how are their behaviors changing and looking at that. We then took it to the field onto forest service land and private ranches. The first year, because of the complex study, we just focused on one site and then expanded it out to a two additional sites. So what did we do? So just introduce you to our other players here that we have to give thanks to. Our solitary bee species is Osmia bruneri. It's a mid-season solitary bee. It's beautiful. The way that we can manage it is that we have bees, cocoons, the diapausing bees, males and females. We can seed our nest blocks at what's this block of wood and we have little paper straws in there we can pull those straws with completed nests. We have x-ray technology, it lets us peek inside and see what's going on. We can do counts, look at the success of them, disease symptoms, et cetera. For the wild field studies, those cavities are actually, there's competition for those cavities by the endemic bees. So we replace those uh, nests as they're filled. So put new tubes in there. It was not a competition going on for that. For the bumblebee down at the bottom, this is Bombas huntii, or the hunt bumblebee. It's the most beautiful bee, I think, that I've seen, the cutest little one. We could collect the wild-caught queens, and then we can rear them up on sterile pollen that we've sterilized with ethylene oxide to get rid of pathogens and get them up to a certain colony size. We then devise containers, secondary container that protects them, allows ventilation. And we also figured out how to peek inside because bumblebees, it turns out, are very defensive. They don't like you opening them and looking at them. So we used a boroscope to peer inside and see how they were growing. We also had acetate sheets underneath the colonies to collect pathogens and look for them. The honeybees, the colonies from our cooperator, there were four Langstroth boxes on a pallet, which is how commercial bees are moved around. The apiary sizes were restricted to 48 colonies. This was by agreement between a lot of different commercial beekeepers weighing in on this. And then for our cage studies, we put them into these smaller boxes here. They actually link together. So if you have a huge wind like we typically do, they stay intact. We actually put full-size packages inside. For the cage studies, we adjusted it so that every bumblebee colony had the exact same number of bees. For the honeybee hives, exact same number of frames of the bees. And for the solitary bees, exact same number of bees. The first year for our cage study, we, because of the success of the lab previously, we used just one florals resource, the Facelia here because it had worked great for our solitary bees. It turns out solitary bees did great on it just by themselves. Bumblebees and honeybees, those colonies went down over time. They needed a much greater diversity of flowers. So the year two and three, we planted these eight species here that gave us flowers across the entire season. We had equal seeding rates across the strips here, arranged our cages out 
and then randomized within the three different strips so that we had two cages with all species together and one cage with a single species in there. Same number of bees per species in each of the cages. Okay. So this gives you an idea of what it looks like. So our solitary bees, the little blue box there, that's where our solitary bee nests are. Again, we removed the nests when they were completed and replaced it with brand new straw. You can see in the bottom there that we're peeking in on a bumblebee box cage with our boroscope. And then with the honeybees, we op wore bee suits and did your typical manipulation. So what did we learn? From the case study, we did generate competition. It's very clear cut between when the bees were alone versus when they are all crowded together. We saw a restricted reproduction for osmia, decreased colony growth for bumblebees and for honeybees. We did see that these osmia shifted in one of their flora preferences for two of the plants. They increased foraging when there were other bees around for one species and decreased it for one. But we did not see any upticks or changes in the bumblebees or honeybees. We also went out and observed how did they interact on the flowers? Were there any bullies around? And we didn't see that. We didn't see honeybees crowding the others out or bumblebees knocking osmia off the flowers. Often to admit, we saw mid-air collisions. We should have had a flight control person in there. Um, and so what we, we also did not see any overt disease symptoms showing up in one species of bee or another. We're still doing molecular analyses here. So yes, we generated competition. We had, we can see the symptoms and recognize it. We've also learned that osmia can do really well on one floral host. It raises the question, what do they have that the other two species don't have? This requirement for diversity of flowers has been reported for others for honeybee research and bumblebees as well. Okay, we then took it to the field. And so this was to ask, what is the impact of the honeybee apiary when placed in a wild area? And we have our sentinel bees here to monitor. And the reason that's critical to have these sentinel bees, if you try to go out in a wild area and try to find a bumblebee nest or even these solitary bee nests, you're going to fail. <laughs> they train dogs to go sniffing for bumblebees and that doesn't even work that well. So having our sentinel colonies was essential. So we went into the national forest to the east of Logan. And um, this shows you a map of our locations. There's a very large natural lake near there, Bear Lake. And the reason to point this out is we're an hour and a half north of Salt Lake City, a big metropolitan area. This is a hot spot for recreation for people probably from Salt Lake, but maybe elsewhere coming in. So we have the area in the pink down below, Blacksmith Fork Apiary. This is where there's this long-term private ranch that an apiary had been located for over 20 years, having at minimum 48 to 96 to twice as many of that during that 28 years. And the non-apiary site down there is on Forest Service land, no history of any placed bees. We then also had two other areas, Twin Creek, which is right along the highway leading out of Logan over to this Bear Lake, very high traffic area, and then Franklin Basin, which is on a dirt gravel road in there. How we designed it was within each of these sites, here this bullseye, the center of that is where the apiary is and we put our sentinel beads. Five kilometers to nine kilometers away, we placed another group of sentinel bumblebees alone on areas that we had no history, no knowledge of there ever being a bumblebee or sorry, honeybees in that area anywhere in here. In between, at both of those sites, we put the solitary bees and then at five other sites in between. So the idea here is that honeybees would be flying out looking for resources. So there's been some reports of very long distance for honeybees, but the measures I give here are what are experimentally reported and the, the only data I could find on how far bees, honeybees forage. 
So we monitored each of these sites, looking at the flowers in those sites, and also endemic bees, and monitored the health of these colonies every two weeks. Okay, so let's talk about something I didn't appreciate, the complexity of how these forest lands are being used. So there's a mission statement here for the U.S. Forest Service, but there's all this, this slogan that was used in the 2000s, the land of many uses. And this is very true, I can attest to this. So we did this starting in 2020, which of course is beginning of COVID, and there were a lot of people wanting to escape that, but we now know that they're just escaping all the time to come into the Forest Service. So there's a lot of people recreating on these gravel roads. Some of them I worried about taking my SUV out on, but there's people driving their big camping trailers out and finding anywhere to park, not an organized campground, to park to put their campers and tenting. But there's also groups coming up with the ATVs as a club. So this gift here is showing this dust cloud there are people driving up and down these roads all the time. It's creating significant dust. There are papers showing that dust itself, the, like this, can impact the flowers and decrease your floral quality. And papers showing that pollution from cars can also do this. So recreation was one of our, our things to contend with. And then I didn't anticipate it, but every area that we had had grazing permits, the private ranch, obviously, but there are also sheep and grazing permits on there. And then this historical apiary. So talking about grazing here, I come from Colorado and my family has this history of cattle farming and my dad grew up on a sheep farm that took sheep to the mountains. So I was astounded here. So I don't wanna sound anti-cow sheep, but I was astounded. Showing on the left side here is before and after picture of the day that they brought in seven truckloads of sheep, offloaded them right near our bumblebee only apiary, and then herded them up. The sheep took every flower off. They didn't touch the other parts of the plant. I was like, why not? <laughs> you know, and this horse mint that's here, that's blooming, it never rebloomed. All the flowers were gone. So there is this impact there. The cows were a little bit more selective, except when it came to drought. And what you're seeing here on the right is not the traces of my crew trapsing through there, but the cows are actively looking for forage and feeding on things that they probably would not have fed upon if it was not a drought year. So there is this impact from other herbivores looking for food on the flowers too. So we also looked at endemic bees. The bees were found in that area. And we used two methods, bowl traps. So these colored bowls here that we put out with soapy water and the bees and other pollinators are attracted into it. And then we also had grids set up with flowers and we netted the bees off of those. And we monitored that every two weeks. And we have to thank Trish Wynn, who was a botanist for the Forest Service. She helped us with IDing the plants and uh, figuring it out. So we were actually quantitating bee visitation and who were, where they were going to. Those bees have all now been pinned and identified thanks to Schuyler Burroughs. And we're analyzing, pulling that data together to do an analysis here. There's over 7,000 individual pinned bees that we collected these three years. So it's significant, the first time this has been done in this particular region for a survey like this. We also counted the florals. Floral abundance did not differ significantly between our two, three different parent sites, equal number of flowers, and did not differ between honeybee sites versus the bumblebee only sites. But year did have a big impact, as I said, we have a drought out there. This area went from moderate drought to exceptional drought to severe drought at different times. And in 2021 is when we had the exceptional drought. There are much less flowers, significantly less. We also asked about diversity or richness. What type of flowers are there? So we didn't 
expect this, but our blacksmith fork area with this private ranch had the greatest diversity of flowers present. So it did differ, but between our honeybee site and the non-honeybee site within there, there was no difference in the diversity of our flowers. Twin Creek had the least diversity present. We looked at what honeybees were visiting versus our non-honeybees. This gives you our plant genera here. So I put names on some of the biggest tractors of flowers. That horse mint, the one the sheep also liked, is, is one that the honeybees and the other bees liked. The tintilia, mallow were top ones. Rabbit brush, you ask me about rabbit brush later. I'm on a, a crusade to get more rabbit brush out there in seed mixes. And then on the private ranch, there was also an invasive thistle. Honeybees did not visit that thistle. It was all the other bee species visiting the thistle, which was our surprise too. So you can see that there was this wide diversity there. We also compared pan traps versus netting. It turns out, yes, you can get honeybees to go to pan traps. We were able to detect them. So the ones with the stripes in them, that's our honeybee collections. Netting on top, the pan traps on bottom. The starred areas are where osmia are, the, and the arrows are where bumblebee collections are. So we do see a wide diversity of bees across all our sites here. Okay, so how did they do? Within the apiaries, we monitored for varroa mites, which you heard are a major pest. We did this before and after the end of the season. We did not see a significant number of varroa mites in these colonies. However, within every apiary, we saw a 10% loss of colonies, primarily through the death of the queen. And this is matching what most commercial beekeepers see is that queens are very short-lived and tend to die out. We also, with our cooperator, that movement into the Forest Service occurred earlier every year because temperatures were warming up sooner. But also in 2021, exit from that forest occurred extremely early too. He pulled his bees out in July. So it happened very early. And Darren Cox shared with me and he was, gave permission that I could share his actual amount of money or honey, that did translate money I hope, that he got out for each year. And you can see 2021 here, a significantly lower amount of honey being made with this drought here. We had another surprise that we didn't anticipate, and it was this species showing up in all our bumblebee colonies. This is Bombus insularis or Cythrus. It's a cuckoo bumblebee. This bee, she has no corbiculae. She can't collect pollen herself. The way she makes her living, she actually invades the colony of another bumblebee species, kills the queen of maybe some of the bigger workers, takes over the colony and enslaves the host to grow up her progeny. So uh, we put out our bumblebees that first year in both our non-apiary, apiary site. Came back two weeks later, Cythrus was found in every colony, much to our dismay. So our colonies, we had a pollen trap on there that had been devised by one of our previous scientists. We figured out how to exclude Cythrus. So it was actually putting a little plastic piece in there. These are 3D printed and it, had a hole that was just big enough for the hunty eye workers to get in and kept Cythrus queens from getting in there. And we were able to have enough extra colonies that we were able to replace them. And we made lemonade out of lemons. We took those Cythrus and we did population genetics. And what we found is that there was equal numbers of Cythrus at the honeybee apiary site and the non-honeybee apiary site and the same genetic diversity. There's some other cool studies. This has been published now. But why is this important for the overall question on how honeybees impact other bees? Cythrus is an apex predator. And so with apex predators, if your prey is being impacted by other stressors, other impacts, it'll translate into impacts on you as the apex predator. We didn't see that. We see that the non-apiary site versus apiary site have the same numbers as citrus and same genetic diversity, which means that this apiary on this private ranch that's been there, the apiary's been 
there in place with 48 to twice, two times 96 colonies, <laughs> it hasn't had an impact the previous season or a long-term impact on the, the bumblebee hosts in that area. So this is important to look at. So shifting over to our solitary bees here, Osmia, what we found is that they're, and I'm showing you the distance, the darker the colors here, the purple is right at apiary, further away is the other colors. We don't see an impact on the number of nest cells that the females are producing. And it dif differ between our parent sites and that. We also see that there's other bees making use of it. Originally, we thought there was this decrease for some of the sites. We now know that the other species, there's multiple species involved, and that doesn't hold true. So we don't see an impact on their reproduction. We also don't see an impact on their health status. We don't see increased death of the bees when they're close to the apiary. We have no evidence for this negative impact there. We do, however, have evidence for climate being a negative impactor. This is showing the three years here for Osmia across all the different year groups. 2020, as I told you, is moderate drought. 2021 was a really bad year, extreme drought. 2022, severe drought. And what you can see is that there's significantly fewer nest cells being made, i.e. less reproduction in 2021. The other part here is looking over on the right-hand side at the graph here. This is the number of females being made for the next season. Those females are the ones that are going to be reproducing the next year. We see a great decrease in the number of females and a shift in the sex ratio as one, normally one-to-one -one male female for the offspring. We saw one female per three males. This potentially could have big dramatic implications for reproduction of the species going forward. So climate had a major impact here. On bumblebees, as I said, we put these out. We learned something here that we didn't understand before because we never follow in colonies through in the field. It turns out it may be that bumblebees have a much harder time reproducing than we ever anticipated. So I'm showing you on the the left-hand side here is the overall growth of the colony, how much organic materials in the nest, how big it got. The blue bars are honeybee apiary, the red bars are non-honeybee. It's divided up by three parent sites. We see that those in honeybee apiary are apt to grow just as big or bigger than some of the others. We also, the middle bars here, number of open cells, how many workers they're producing. We see that those in honeybee apiary, we're doing better. On the far right are the number of queen cells being made. And we're seeing that the colonies that are near the honeybees are just as apt to make queens as those that are farther away. So size of the colony, when we put them out, this last year we did a Hail Mary and put any of the colonies that we had out there, including a little tiny one. So this one with the green circle it had three, the queen and three workers. When we put it out there later, it made queens. So we have a lot of unanswered questions to follow through on what predicts the success rate of these bumblebees that are out there. And does this translate into normal success of endemic colonies? So uh, we're free to share that question with any other researchers that wanna tackle it. <laughs> All right, so sum up here. Apiary presence did not impact the reproduction of the sentinel bumblebees or solitary bees in the field. Climate did have a major impact on the solitary bees, the honeybee colonies, and the floral resources. And we have no direct evidence for exclusion of non-apis bees by honeybees. We're still analyzing now our identified bee species and the flowers visiting it to see if there's underlying interactions that we might have missed i.e. specialist bees and, and the flowers that they visit. We also have no negative impact for honeybees on the health of the others. We're still following up on the molecular analyses. That's one thing that got impacted by COVID and getting people in the lab to do the work. So we're still doing that. But my graduate student, Mary Kate Williams, 
we have been able to set up in vitro rearing of Osmia lignaria, the blue orchard bee, going from egg all the way through to the adult. And we've been able to manipulate both the pollen and add in stress factors, i.e. pathogens, viruses that are found on all the bees, as well as Nosema serrani, as well as my favorite stressor, org organosilicone spray adjuvants. And it turns out that Osme is one tough little bee. We have no impact of these feeding them directly these viruses or the Nosema and even giving them a stressor at this point, some very minor changes. So understanding more how these germs move about and if they're really impacting these other species is an important question. Okay, back to this, the carrying capacity. I think this sums up where we need to be thinking and I can provide data, I don't create regulation. That's our rule in ARS. So we have our endemic bees in the area, but this carrying capacity, what are the amount of flowers that you have and how many can you support with that? And it's not just managed apiary, honeybees, managed insect livestock, but you also have to think about other consumers over here, the natural herbivores and the sheep and the cows that might be introduced into these areas. And the underlying causes here, that weather, how much rain, temperature, and I'd put in there this recreational use, the dust off from vehicles. So with that, um, if you have any further questions or you want to chat more length, feel free to send me or call me up. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to um, our first day of NAPSI here. Um, my name is Vicki Wojcik, and I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our first after lunch speaker. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Zach Gazon. Dr. Zach Gazon is the conservation director with Disney Conservation. His projects range from tracking migratory birds over thousands of miles and across continents to creating an acre after acre of pollinator habitat in Florida, to working with communities that make sure Disney's conservation programs inspire global communities to save wildlife and protect the planet. Zach's specific area of interest is in pollinating insects such as butterflies and bees. Now um, I'd like to, and now we'll hear um, Dr. Gazon's presentation about leading by example, aiming to be the corporate leader in pollinator conservation and community engagement. Thank you. Big arrow forward. You got it. Big arrow forward. Hopefully I only have to go forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm very, very excited to be here because typically, and this happens, you know, whether it's big conferences or, you know, around the Thanksgiving uh, dinner table, when I'm telling people that I do conservation and science and that I work for Disney, I get very puzzled looks, right? And that's because we are a big, famous storytelling company that is mostly famous for our fiction. And we're not as famous for our nonfiction. But I would like to just say, you know, now that we are over a, a century old company, um, this man right here, Walt Disney, is still the world record holder for the most Academy Awards won by an individual. And over half of those are for nature films, right? And this conservation was something that was core to him as a human. He felt like you cannot build a business telling stories through cartoon anthropomorphic animals singing songs if those animals do not exist in real life. They must be there and you must look at yourself as a species alongside with them. And um, this is absolutely core to who he was. And when uh, the land in Florida was acquired to make Walt Disney World, it, well, I don't, have, you, have you guys been to Walt Disney World? Some yes, some no. It's an amazing place. It's twice as big as Manhattan. It's 30,000 acres. And there's these amazing hand-drawn drawings of Walt Disney World as he was planning it, where he put this big corridor from top to bottom and left to right throughout the whole thing. And he declared from the very beginning, a third of this is and will always be conservation land. 
And when you go to Walt Disney World and you ride on the Skyliner and you're driving around, you're like, man, it seems like really lost, lost in the woods out here. You are. Well, you're not lost, but you're in the woods and it's filled with wildlife and it's wild places and it's incredible. This is, you know, core to uh, the Walt Disney Company and it and always has been. And thankfully, it still is. Our current uh, uh, CEO, Bob Iger, is equally committed to the environment. You know, we there's a lot on our shoulders as one of the world's biggest storytelling companies to tell stories that are entertaining and inspiring and also hopefully make the world a better place and make people feel inspired to be able to have a difference and go out and, uh, and uh, make the world a better place through their actions as well. And so uh, as Disney Conservation, what we do is we want to do, well, really three things, but it all goes to try to make the world a better place for humans, for communities, and uh, the communities of both animals and plants and, and human communities as well. Right. And so what we really want to do, we kind of have a, a, a three pronged approach to what we do. You know, we're a big company. We have a global impact. I'm a nerd and I've done science with sciencey nerds all around the world and everywhere I've gone. You know, if you're in Greenland and they're doing ice cores, you know, people are spending their nights watching Star Wars movies and Marvel films, you know, and same things down in McMurdo and Antarctica. The nerds there are also spending their nights watching uh, Star Wars films and Disney movies. And all around you know, the, the equator, when you go there, Disney has an impact there too. And so we want to do our part as a global st storytelling company to make sure we're having an impact. And sometimes that means doing the work ourselves. Sometimes that means funding other people that are boots on the ground doing work around the world. Sometimes it's somewhere in between. And always, always, always telling the story, getting people involved, and, and communicating uh, what we care about. So this is, you know, a Disney presentation, sort of. And so it has to have a hero. It has to have a hero. There has to be a story arc. And it's not me, obviously, and it's not Walt Disney even in this particular case. It's this guy right here. This is Dr. Frank Joyce. Um, he leads a, 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 a tropical ecology program uh, down in Costa Rica. And the kind of the inspiration for this talk for me kind of goes back to this guy right here. And he kind of blew my mind one time. We were on a nature walk uh, and he was teaching tropical ecology to a bunch of students. And uh, he was teaching about plant reproductive systems. And he, he took a particular plant and he was teaching us about different plant reproductive strategies. And he said, this is a dioecious plant. Uh, this plant, it has two houses. It has a, a, a male house and a female house. Right. That's where. And he said, you know, that's the etymology of this term dioecious. It comes from the word oikos and it means two houses. And then he kind of went off on a tangent. He said, you know. The word oikos, it comes up in really interesting places. You know, it's not just dioecious plants. It's also where we get eco from ecology. And we think of ecology as being the study of of plants and animals and their communities and populations and interactions with each other and in the environment. But, you know, it, it literally means the study of our home. Ecology is just the study of our home. It's where we live, right? We've only got one. We've got to take good care of it. And it also is the root word of uh, economy, right? So ecology is the study of our home. Economy is the management of our home, right? And are these things at odd? You know, we certainly know that economic growth can be bad for the environment, but does it have to be? You know, are we two separate houses or do we need to look at things in a way where they feed each other? You cannot have one without the other for an indefinite period of time. One has to inform the other. They both have to be considered or it's just not going to work. And so what we try to do, we try to approach conservation and science from a, a, uh, a kind of a human centric um, uh, perspective where we think, you know, what is really going to have a positive impact? Kind of to your question earlier with the farmers, you know, have, have you done the social science? How do you move the needle in terms of what is going to be perceived? It is so important. You absolutely have to look at things from where are we, what resonates and what's going to work, right? And because I'm a B nerd, I always think of things in terms of mutualism, right? It can be set up in such a way that everybody wins. You can set the game up in such a way that it all works out and it's a positive, positive interaction and we can win. And that's how we try to approach everything that we do. 
And so, like I said, we take a three-pronged approach, right? We, we fund a lot of stuff. We do a lot of stuff. And if you're not telling people about the stuff that you do and inspiring and empowering them, then sometimes you might not as well have done it. So let me go through those three things that we do. The stuff that we fund, the stuff that we do. Sometimes there's a fuzzy in between. I'll talk about that too. And then we try to always use that uh, as a storytelling platform to inspire and to empower. So the Disney Conservation Fund, we're going on 30 years old at this point. Um, and we are, cog we are very, very much aware that you know, in order to really have a conservation impact, it has to be the people on the ground in the places of conservation need that are at the table that are doing the work. Sometimes we can add value to whatever they're doing, but oftentimes they just need the resources wherever they are. And so we have a granting system. We've given out millions and millions of dollars at this point, $125 million to try to move the needle for conservation around the world. Sometimes we can do both. Sometimes we can fund conservation work and we can sometimes add value. This is not a pollinator, to the best of my knowledge. Keep me, keep me honest, Mark. I don't think so. I don't think so. But it is one of my favorite stories to tell that does involve pollination um, of not a North American pollinator, but a pollinator that we all know very, very well. So uh, many, many years ago, uh, uh, some people with Save the Elephants Foundation were in Kenya. They were walking through um, uh, uh, an area uh, with the Samburu people, and they noticed all of these trees had been trampled. And they said, why? But there was like three trees that had not been trampled. And they said, why? what happened with these three trees? And they said, oh, there's honeybees in those trees, elephants hate bees. Elephants hate bees. And I, yeah, right, that's interesting. And so working with the local communities in these area, a program was developed to build fences with suspended honeybees around the farms, right? And a lot of science had to go into this and we have uh, elephants at Disney's Animal Kingdom and we want to make sure that their well-being is very, very high. If there's fireworks or other loud noises, we look at their behavior. We have wonderful audio-visual equipment. And so we went to Kenya and we worked with the people in these communities. And we did experiments. We recorded honeybees. And we played them to elephants. When, you, when elephants in the area hear honeybees, they shake their head and they say, bees, and they run away. And if you keep doing it, they get used to it. They know that you're faking and they stop doing it, right? But if you take the sound of an elephant screaming bees, an elephant, and you play it to other bees in an area, they have dialects, but if you play it to the elephants of those areas, you know, you, you, they hear an elephant go bees and they shake their head, and those elephants say bees and they shake their head and they run away too, right? But again, they will learn that it's not sustainable. You actually have to have real bees. And so there's a lot of science that we are able to help um, these communities with and develop this program. And now you have, it's now happening in 23 countries around the world where you have small subsistence farms with suspended honeybees around the farms. And when elephants come through the area, they're like bus sized raccoons essentially. When they come into an area and they bump up against the honeybee hives, the hives shake, the bees come out, the elephants shout bees, they run away and you don't lose your crops. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to use a native species to the area. It uh, has been very empowering for the women in the communities who typically don't have a source of income, but they're um, making uh, products out of the bees um, uh, for, from the wax and from the uh, honey, um, and the crops are safer. It's a wonderful win-win. It's a very people-centric approach. We want to make sure that humans are happy and thriving and the, uh, the environment wins as a, as a benefit. The other thing that we did there, um, and this is mostly for you, Mark, because Mark and I were talking about how it's funny how as you grow up into a scientist, you eventually get to the point where you're no longer in the field doing the work. You instead are trying to save species from a laptop. Um, one of the things that we help them do is uh, install a big elephant observation tower so that when the elephants are coming through, they can see the elephants are coming through and communicate to one another to be careful. And that's nice because it frees you up to go back and continue working from a laptop. It doesn't matter what you do or where you are. Even in, uh, in Kenya, in Savo National Park, you're somehow going to go back to uh, trying to save species from a laptop. Let's go to Florida. So um, we also want to make sure that whatever we're doing around the world, we're doing it in a way that hopefully is having not just not a bad impact, but a positive impact, right? So we are very, very committed to our sustainability and to our uh, nature and biodiversity efforts. Um, last year, I was very, very honored um, that we got the, uh, the uh, 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 Electric Power Award. Thank you. I'm very, very pleased about that. 
and this is a lot of work that, uh, that Morgan is uh, doing the heavy lifting on, so I'm, I'm get to uh, brag about her for, uh, for just a few minutes, and Shannon, Shannon as well. You, po you, uh, you show up there, Shannon. I'm sorry to embarrass you, but it's going to happen. So uh, we currently have, uh, there are solar arrays in and around Disney World. Uh, it provides enough power to uh, power two of our four theme parks. We have um, 55 megawatts of power production. Um, we are currently in the, the process of quadrupling that. Um, within the next few years, there should be enough electricity produced by these solar arrays um, to power uh, about 40% of all of Walt Disney World. That's everything, transportation, resorts, uh, roller coasters, Space Mountain, everything. And we want to make sure we're doing that in a way that is also providing wildlife habitat. And that is not as easy as it sounds because you need to come up with a species mixture that isn't going to shade the solar panels, that isn't going to have vines that grow up them and choke things out, um, that provides hopefully meaningful resources to the pollinators and to other things. But pollinators are nice because they don't mind chain link fences. They'll fly right through them, right? And so, you know, we want to look at every single square inch of the 30,000 acres that we have there and do it in a, as nature positive way as possible. Take that science, communicate it out, and help really try to make sure that others can do, do the same thing. So a lot of the work that we do there is not just you know, determining the best management practices for putting in the pollinator habitat, but assessing the bee populations there and the communities there and asking questions about, it, does it, is it just all hopes and dreams? Is it just wishful thinking? When you put in pollinator habitat, is there a noticeable impact on the community and, and, uh, and to what degree and how far does it reach, right? So doing questions like pan trapping for bees, well, a lot of the, the same type of uh, techniques that we saw a moment ago, doing that in the solar rays where we've added uh, pollinator habitat, in solar rays where we've not added pollinator habitat, in more uh, wilderness-like areas, how do the communities compare? What is the impact that we're having and how do we, uh, um, how do, we do that? So here's Shannon out in the, uh, in the field, helping us to assess uh, our flowering plant communities. What is the relationship between the, the, uh, uh, the landscapes that we help create and manage and the, uh, the impact on the bees themselves? So uh, we are currently trying to identify all of these bees. We've found um, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of native bee species on our property so far. Um, as we all know, when you catch 7,000 bees, the biggest bottleneck is IDing from Terry. Terry knows this well. IDing those bees is real hard, and uh, we're currently working with other partners. We're doing some in-house and, and working with others, uh, trying to uh, determine our bees and, uh, and publish that um, soon. And we've already come out with a, a, a position paper on um, the best management practices for creating pollinator habitat in solar rays in the southeast that we can uh, share out with partners and try to get, um, uh, you know, we're not, we're not trying to pretend that it's the definitive best management practice, but we want to advance the science as much as possible and be involved uh, with that conversation. And we, we always want to inspire others to do as well. So sometimes that's nerdy position papers, sometimes it's going to conferences, sometimes it's statistics, sometimes it's TV shows. Right, so here you can see Morgan being a role model for future young scientists, pollination ecologists, and you know, children watching TV shows like The Magic of Disney's Animal Kingdom, where they can see people that look like them saving species and being heroes, and we really want to foster that. Because this whole idea of having companies that are built on you know, being good stewards of the environment, you can, that there's only economic pressure to do that if the world cares. Right, so you have to install that love for the environment and the feeling that you can make a difference, and that puts pressure on us to do it well. Do I have one minute left, man? Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Never mind. Five minutes. Go get. Excellent. I'll keep going then. So we make uh, acre after acre after acre of pollinator habitats in our solar arrays, and those are going to look very different from some of the other areas where we can put in uh, uh, pollinator habitats. So uh, we have pollinator gardens all over Walt Disney World as well, and they look quite different because there's meant to be a reflection of landscapes that you could recreate at home. So this is a pollinator garden in an area of Walt Disney World called Conservation Station. And this is an area where hopefully it is a reflection of what somebody could do at home. It's, it's meant to more, look more like a backyard garden. And we have uh, awesome uh, natural history interpretation guides who go out and they talk to the kids and they inspire them. And so we thought, well, maybe this is an opportunity to not only do uh, you know, the work of you know, what ornamental plants actually have an impact on the, pollinating, uh, uh, the pollinator communities in Walt Disney World, but what actually makes for a good pollinator garden from the guest perspective. And that means what actually makes pollinators visible to guests, 
right? And so in addition to going out and having trained biologists do surveys on what pollinators they see in our pollinator gardens, we, uh, we made a little, uh, it, this is on a, a whiteboard with a grease pen, and it's a little natural um, uh, a nature ID guide of, you know, very, very simple high level ID guide for the pollinators and different types of plants. And what we specifically wanted to know was our horticulture department, they want tall red pentas. It's the, that, that's the go-to plant. We thought, great, what about, what about like Gallardia? What about some of these other things? Is there a way to determine which plants make pollinators most visible to our guests? And so what would happen is that, you know, the kids and the families come up. These are kids that are like three years old, literally. They'd have a grease pen and this little uh, nature ID guide, and they would just write down a start time and a stop time, and they would write down what bugs they saw on different plants. And we would take a photo of it, wipe it down, give it to the next guest, and then we'd later go back and, and quantify all of their observations from the photos and see what they saw. Do you think three-year-olds are able to determine that some plants are better for seeing insects than others? Yeah? Yes, absolutely. They were. Very granular. But yes, let's just skip that. Skip. There we go. There we go. So very simple data. Remember, th these are data that were collected by a three-year-old. But what we saw is tall red pentas were actually the least good at making pollinators visible for the kids and families that come and visit our, our theme parks. And Gallardia uh, was the best. And the nice thing was this was, mon this was actually bumblebees and butterflies that they saw on these plants. Um, but we actually see tons and tons of native bees here as well. And so we're currently looking at this as a citizen science project or a community science project. How good are those data in relation to biologists' data? Is there a correlation? Can we collect data at a really high um, volume with three-year-olds and their families and use that? Is there a corrective faction, uh, factor to see how does that relate to professional scientists' data? So that's something that we're currently, we're currently working on. And of course, pollinator gardens are just gorgeous and it's a nice background for all sorts of other guest programming, right? So whether it's just making uh, little photo opportunities to try to encourage others to go do nature photography, whether it's my family going there and doing a meet and greet with a giant bug, Right? I, oh, you want to see my family again? I'll go back. Ah, I couldn't be more proud. I couldn't be more proud. My family's nice too. Or just as a place where on Earth Day we can um, set it up to have people, uh, you know, uh, treat the world and nature as a marvelous background to be appreciated and photographed. We're always trying to see what we can do. I've got one minute. I'm going to go a little bit quicker. This is the Atala Butterfly, a marvelous program. We're always looking for ways that we can build a program that is multifaceted to have a conservation impact and also a guest experience. This is a species that is uh, endemic to Florida that we thought went extinct many years. It was, you know, everyone assumed it had been extinct for like decades. It was rediscovered off of the barrier islands. And uh, we, uh, we developed this big program where we would do habitat restoration. We would raise them at Disney's Animal Kingdom. And then we would move them out to areas where the species lives and let kids go on the nature trail where we had done habitat restoration and release the butterfly. So it was this awesome combination of, you know, a habitat restoration and then uh, releasing butterflies for a conservation effort. And they were doing it, you know, like these kids were getting to hold a butterfly on their hand that was thought to have gone extinct. And it was this really amazing thing. It was just like absolutely, uh, you know, uh, chilling to see, not chilling in a good way. It would just, it would give you goosebumps because it was so marvelous. I'm gonna keep going. One last thing I want to talk about is, uh, um, you know, using monarchs as, you know, just it's. I'm, I'm speaking to the right audience when I say this. Is that, you know, insects are the backbone of biodiversity, and there are very few insects that are instantly recognizable and that people know to species level. You know, you, at, you see as many tattoos of monarch butterflies as you see of the actual insects at this point. And, you know, that is simultaneously totally scary and heartwarming. I'm all for more insect tattoos, but we also have to have uh, more butterflies. And so one of the programs that I run is uh, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums Saving Animals from Extinction program about the North American monarch butterfly. Uh, we have about half of AZA institutions as program partners at this point. And what we really want to do is use them as a spokes insect and um, as a model for the impact that an individual can have in their, in their community. Um, 
And one of the ways that we do this, uh, that we started off with our own uh, high school in our local area is through the, the 3DE program. The 3DE program is a, is a program where um, Junior Achievement as an organization tries to pair uh, local industries or business leaders with local high schools, get those um, industry leaders into the high school to try to make the things that they're learning in the school less esoteric and show the things and the skills that they're learning in the classroom have a direct relationship to their life outside of the classroom, whether that's public speaking, communications, applying for grants, the things that they're learning in there will have a real life impact very, very soon. And that's what we're aiming to do. So, uh, so we go to this, uh, you know what, I'm gonna skip ahead really quick. I'm, a, I'm running short on time. This is worth two minutes. Is, do I have two minutes? Let's let them talk about this. The video that they made after we had there, it's going to be choppy, but uh, you know, if, if it's too obnoxious to look at with your eyeballs, just close and listen uh, to them talk about the program. And a little cool tool. Okay. This shows us that this sends a message that they can see something that knows that can be out there. Right. It says to me that they actually care about what we are. They see what we can become. They see our potential. So when they come in here, it means a lot. It's awesome. This is our Disney Conservation Fund. Mine is Olivia, Joseph, Jeffrey, Michaela. It makes me, it makes me feel important. And, and like, you know, it means a lot because they're willing to like come down here and see the ideas we have and what we could provide to the company. These children are our future storytellers. They're the ones that are gonna be making magic and making dreams come true. And for us to be able to come in and work with them individually to help them hone their skills and be prepared for a bright future is really a gift. We had so much fun. It was an honor to be a judge for these incredible students in their 3DE. They really demonstrated not only their passion, for what they were researching, but all of the competencies that will ultimately set them up for success for their future. This meant so much for me to see these guys up here and they had done their research, they had practiced their lines and I have been on this journey. I know how intimidating it is to get up in front of your peers and strangers and experts and they just nailed it. They did such a good job delivering their message and you can really see how much they put into it. For them to get up there and show courage and show that they've learned about a specific topic and projected out in front of their peers, um, in addition to us, it's just they, they really did a wonderful job. That's very important because it means they like actually care about what they're doing and they care about getting the youth more involved. And I think it's like it will be really helpful for me in the future because I want to have good presentation skills. So after one of these, uh, the sessions, um, you know, I, I looked back and one of the teacher was just absolutely weeping and we asked her what was going on. And she said one of her students was up there speaking in a second language and it was something that he'd been really struggling with. And he came out of his shell in a way that she really hadn't seen before. And it was just, I mean, honestly, I get choked up thinking about it. So this is a program that we've been working on and we're currently in the progress of trying to grow that. And we'd like to grow it even more. If this is something that you're interested in, please reach out to me. I'm gonna stop there because I know we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much. Up here because, um, <laughs> thanks, Zach. So we do have time for a few questions. So we'll take uh, one from the audience and then any online questions. There's a question from Lori. That was great, Zach. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning that every story has to have a hero. Usually the story also has an whatever the villain is. In telling conservation stories, oftentimes you see them set up, even documentaries, as having that same story arc. Have you found that there's a way to not villainize and still tell an effective conservation story? What advice would you give us? You know, that's a, that's a great, that's a really, really great question. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that makes storytelling compelling and rich is when the villains are not one-sided and they don't think of themselves as the villain. The villain is the hero in their own story. Every, nobody looks at themselves as the villain. Everyone is the hero in their own story. 
And if you can look at whatever you're looking at as the villain, as the hero of their own story, and if you can put yourself in their shoes, and if you can try to think of things, you know, from, you know, a multifaceted approach where everybody is trying to achieve something, then I think that, you know, you can move past that and you can try to start to work together. But the, the key for me always is to, you know, just try to be, consider what everybody else is going through and don't think of, you know, people or industry or whatever as the villain. They're trying to achieve a particular thing. But we need to figure out what our common interests are. And I guarantee there are some. And then we can try to work towards that together. Amber, uh, online questions. Yeah, absolutely. All right, wonderful. It looks like we have time for a couple questions. And so, um, yes, uh, one of our online participants wanted to know, you know, what are some of the main grant opportunities that are provided through Disney? That's a great question. So um, we are always looking at our funding strategy and looking at what makes the most sense. If you go to Disney.com slash conservation, um, you can see, uh, you know, the, the other organizations that we have uh, granted to. And um, then you'll be able to learn on there when our current when our granting cycle is, is opening. So uh, so keep an eye on Disney.com slash conservation and you can you can see what opportunities there might be. Excellent. Thank you. And we have one more uh, if we have time. All right. Uh, how do you manage um, when people don't like the aesthetics of native plantings or are scared of the bees and, and other pollinators that they invite into your park space? That is a marvelous question. Yeah. So, yeah. How, how do you deal with the fact that sometimes people don't like the aesthetic? That, that's a hard one. But I will say that we try to we always try to meet the audience where they are. Um, and, you know, people are paying ticket prices and they want to see nicely manicured ornamental gardens. So if it's going to be a guest facing garden, we we try to make what's called a hybrid garden. Um, and a hybrid garden is going to be a mixture of native plants and uh, ornamental plants that are the tried and true workhorses that are low maintenance. Um, and if we're going to have, uh, w when we have host plants, we'll try to put them back behind some shrubbier plants. So if they get all shoddy and chewed up, you know, it doesn't look like it's ill kept, right? So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have like the, like the lower growing um, uh, flowering plants up front. Then we'll have um, something like Hamelia, which is like a little shrubbier in, uh, in the back. Behind that, we have the host plants. So that way, hopefully, we can have something that is providing meaningful, real habitat. It looks good and is hopefully low effort to maintain. And the host plants are hidden in a way that when they get chewed up, which for me is a big sign of success, it doesn't look like we're just neglecting our landscape. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. That was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> wonderful. Um, and now our final presentation of the public session. I'd like to introduce actually another man in a pollinator jacket. I believe Zach and David may have chatted with each other before this. Dr. David Anyway. Um, Dr. Anyway is a professor emeritus at the University of Maryland, and he's the principal investigator at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in Colorado. He's worked for 53 years and has a variety of long-term projects still on the go. He's been working on bumblebees, pollinating flies, butterflies, and hummingbirds, and the many species of wildflowers that they visit. And you can learn more about his research from the April 2023 um, National Geographic magazine that highlighted his work. He's also been a NAPSI partner for 23 years. So David, I'd like to welcome you up here, and we're all excited to hear your presentation. Thanks, Vicki. Um, happy to be here and uh, forward one more I'm going to start while they straighten this out. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to be here at the first uh, NAPSI uh, meeting I've been to in person for maybe three years. So it's, it's fun to, to uh, be back and uh, see all the old friends again and, and meet some new ones. Um, you've actually seen a, a couple of pictures that I'm going to show as Zach showed a picture of uh, Gothic Mountain and a meadow that I'm going to show a picture of. Well, that's where he did his doctoral uh, field work. 
And uh, this picture of, of a uh, Cytheris that uh, Dan Diana showed in her research was um, is one that I took and, and uh, I was fortunate enough to, to participate in a fashion show where they said, send us pictures of the insects and or the pollinators you're studying. We'll print them on fabric and then give it to a costume designer. And so this, this is uh, my custom jacket. <laughs> Try this there. Okay. So what I want to talk about is some of my long-term research at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. Uh, and I first went there as a student to take classes in 1971, decided it looked like a good place to do graduate work. And so after I started as a PhD student in uh, 1972, I went back there and 53 years later, I'm, I'm still working out there um, and actually have the good fortune that uh, my son and his wife, who, who met as college students at the field station, are, are now taking the lead on some of these long-term projects. So they're, uh, some of them are going to go into a second generation. So where I, where I work is in the southwest part of Colorado on the Elk Mountains. Uh, if those of you that are skiers might recognize uh, Crested Butte and the biological lab is located not far away from that, uh, from that ski area. This is what it looks like during the middle of the summer. There are 180 people working there up at 9,500 feet, uh, studying uh, almost all the different kinds of organisms that occur out there, but including a lot of pollinators. Um, and this is what it looked like, uh, oh, maybe about 10 days ago. Uh, we started to get our first snow um, and related to the grazing that uh, Diana talked about here, here are the local ranchers' cows on uh, on private land and national forest land eating. And I, mm, yeah, maybe you can see there's a, a little electric fence there, which I put up in the fall to keep the cows from eating all of my uh, wildflowers, even though they're pretty much finished, finished for the year. Uh, this is what it's gonna look like in another couple of weeks and what it looks like for about half of the year. We get a lot, a lot of snow out there on average about 10, uh, over 10 meters of snow falls. And we are fortunate to have one of the best records of of winter precipitation uh, anywhere in the world, courtesy of the efforts of Billy Barr, who first went out there in 1972 as a student, uh, went back the next year after he graduated from Rutgers and he's basically never left. And he started recording daily observations of uh, how much snow fell, how much was on the ground, when did the snow melt, um, and so forth. This is a picture from that National Geographic uh, article that, uh, that Vicki mentioned. And if you plot some of his data on when is the first date of bare ground, uh, you can see that it's been highly variable as early as the 23rd of April, as late as the 19th of June. Uh, but the overall trend is towards earlier snowmelt. And snow at this altitude uh, sets the phenological clock for the whole rest of the season. And it influences the abundance, uh, both the phenology and the, uh, and the abundance of wildflowers up there. So uh, the more snow historically, uh, the more flowers uh, and the later flowering occurs. So uh, we're in for some interesting and somewhat discouraging perhaps uh, uh, future times with regard to wildflowers and therefore pollinators because of this changing environment. Uh, if you look at the numbers of days of snow cover, uh, sort of arbitrarily picked a break point there, but you can see that uh, for the first few decades of our work out there, there was actually a trend towards increasing snowpack uh, and snow cover, uh, numbers of days of snow cover, and but that trend is now reversed. And if you look at the numbers of days of uh, snow melt until the first fall temperature of about 25 degrees Fahrenheit, which is essentially the growing season, you can see that the growing season is getting longer. So in some ways that, that might be beneficial for plants, but um, on the other hand, there are some, some uh, caveats to that. Uh, we happen to be in one of the, or close to one of the hottest hot spots for temperature in uh, in the United States. Here's a, a blow up of that smaller area, um, and the little, whoops, the little, sorry, the little pentangle there uh, is where the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab is located. Uh, so we're we're just outside the boundary of that that uh, real hot spot. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about phenology, which is the timing of seasonal events. And there's a really neat paper that came out this year uh, about how uh, a phenological calendar may actually be the first writing system that our species used. And if you look at the cave drawings in 
caves like Lascaux in France or some of the caves in uh, Spain where there are these pictures of mastodons or uh, uh, other extinct mammals. Um, and there, there are a series of dots, and it apparently uh, provides information about which phase of the moon um, or which part of the moon calendar did those animals appear on the landscape locally. And there's a symbol that looks sort of like an upside-down Y, which they think represents gestation. So when did those animals have their babies? And so that was being recorded 37,000 years ago, that phenological information. So if you want to learn more about that paper, there, take a look at it. So this is a phenological calendar of the flowers that I work with, starting with the uh, spring beauty up there on the, the middle of the top, and then the willows, and the glacier lilies, and then the larkspurs, and then those strawberries, and the violets, and all the way around. And then some of the pollinators that we study in relation uh, to those wildflowers. This is a project that a group of us started in 1973, and I've kept going uh, since then. Uh, so er, three times a week, we, we go out to these 38 or so plots, two by two meter plots, count every flower in them and do that for the whole length of the growing season now. So we've, we've counted a lot of flowers over the years. Um, and uh, 15 years ago, I invited a colleague, uh, Zach's major professor, uh, Dr. Becky Irwin, who's now at North Carolina State University, to join uh, this project and start censusing bees. And she's kept that up now for 15 years and has found, actually it's closer to, uh, closer to 200 species of bees that she's identified um, from a little bit lower than the lab at the lab and a little bit higher than the lab. And that's out of about a thousand, almost a thousand species of native bees uh, that we have in, in the state of Colorado. So uh, here's a picture from that National Geographic article of Becky and one of her research assistants uh, catching bees. They do this with a, a combination of pan traps and uh, nets because bumblebees, for instance, don't aren't dumb enough to end up in most pan traps. And so you, to, to see them, you have to go out and, and catch them with, with nets and identify them, mark them, and release them. And, uh, but the pan trapping does provide uh, a lot of specimens. And so uh, Becky is now probably the world expert on Colorado bees and has uh, taught herself to identify almost all of those 200 species of bees that we're likely to find in those collections. Uh, I might uh, add that a project, that uh, experimental project that Becky and Zach was involved with too, uh, was comparing meadows where there was regular sampling and where there wasn't, just to make sure that we weren't wiping out the local bee population. And they were, they were not able to find a significant uh, decline in the bee populations where they were sampling regularly. So uh, we, we feel a little bit uh, better about um, having all those bees end up in pan traps. This is actually a meadow that uh, Zach showed a picture of where I do a lot of work on this aspen sunflower. Um, I showed Diana a picture at lunch of a sheep eating these flowers because uh, uh, they reduce the abundance of those wildflowers for, for bees, unfortunately. Uh, so in some years, this meadow looks like this. Uh, you can imagine how happy that makes all the bumblebees and the other native bees uh, and flies that, that collect that nectar and pollen. Um, another year, you might go to that same meadow and it looks like, like this. Uh, unfortunately, there uh, are no flowers in that uh, meadow this particular year. And the reason is that there was a frost. And so one of the paradoxical consequences of, of global warming is that uh, although snow melt is happening earlier, the date of the last hard frost is not changing much. And so back when the snow melted in early June and the last hard frost was about the 10th of June, it didn't matter to the plants because they hadn't developed buds yet. But now that on south facing slopes, we sometimes have snow melting in the middle of April and flowering starting shortly thereafter, uh, that means that by the 10th of June, there are a lot of plants that have developed buds, uh, and some of those are frost sensitive, including this sunflower. And so uh, in one of the, one of the long-term projects I've had is counting the numbers of flowers in those, of those sunflowers in a couple of plots. And you can see that there are a lot of zeros, and those are mostly years uh, with, uh, with frost damage including this past year. Another thing you can look, at, perhaps note about this is that if you sort of squint a little bit, it looks like there are cycles going on here. And I think, uh, I think those are real. So I think there's about a 13, 14, 15 year cycle to some of these flowerings. And I'll just use that point to make a plug for why we need long-term studies, because I could have studied that for 15 years, thought, oh, there's a lot of variability. 
uh, but only by continuing it for another 15 years could I begin to say, oh, maybe it looks like there's cycles. And now after three cycles, I'm, I'm pretty confident that that's something that we're seeing. So thank you to the National Science Foundation and you as taxpayers who help support NSF for the little bit of money that, that helps uh, create these plots, with, uh, which only get one data point a year. So it takes a lot of years to, to, to pick out a pattern. So what we see here is that the number of unfrosted flower heads that I count uh, plotted against the day of year of snow melt, the later the snow melts, the more flowers we find because that, uh, that means there's not as much frost damage. That upper left picture shows a frost killed bud um, and a happy sunflower down on the lower right. Another species that's important to pollinators and is also influenced in terms of its phenology and abundance by climate change. This is the Larkspur Delphinium natalianum. I've pulled apart one of the flowers up on the top right there, and you can see where the nectar chamber is back there at the end of the corolla tube. And as you might guess, it takes a relatively long tongue to get the nectar out of that flower. This flower is early in the season. You can see the aspen haven't leafed out yet. And it's visited by long-tongued bumblebees like Bombus apositus, a uh, queen here that's been collecting pollen from the, from the larkspur flowers. Uh, it's also visited by uh, broad-tailed hummingbirds, which are the resident breeding species that we have here uh, flying up from Mexico and uh, spending the summer and uh, po <coughs> pollinating uh, larkspur flowers, among other things. Uh, so another thing that I've counted for, for decades now is the number of flowering larkspur plants in a, in a couple of plots right in the town site at the biological lab. And as is characteristic of, of most of the wildflower populations that we study up there, they're hugely variable from year to year. And so it takes a lot of uh, years of data to pick out patterns, but both for the total number of flowers, which is the upper line, and the total number of plants with flowers, which is the lower line, uh, the more snow we get, the more flowers and the more flowering plants there are. And so uh, if we look at predictions of climate change and realize that there's going to be less snow in the future, that, that bodes poorly for the abundance of these floral flowers and uh, those plants and potentially of, the, of their pollinators, the hummingbirds and the bumblebees that are visiting them. Um, and if you look at the day of year of when they first come into bloom, plotted against snowpack, you can see the more snow it is, the later they come into bloom, the yellow, the yellow points there. And then we've also, I've also plotted here the arrival dates of the migratory hummingbirds each year. And you can see that those lines aren't parallel. That means that these two players, at least historically players in this system, the plant and the pollinator, are, are falling out of synchrony in terms of what, what they used to have historically. And at some point in the future, if these trends keep up, it could be that the hummingbirds are going to be arriving from Mexico after most of these plants are finished flowering. So we'll have to see what, what happens um, in the future with that system. Uh, there have been a, a, number of, a small number of studies looking at the altitudinal and latitudinal distributions of pollinators in response to climate change. And we know that butterflies are moving north. We know that uh, uh, butterflies and we also know bumblebees are moving up in altitude. So when I did my dissertation work here in the early 70s, uh, at the bottom of the valley, there was one community of bumblebees. And then up in the uh, upper reaches of the mountains, there was another group of species. And the lower altitude species are moving up in altitude. And we don't know yet for sure what's going to happen when they get up to the top. Uh, is there just going to be twice as many species of bumblebees all competing for a limited number of resources? Or are those former alpine species going to get kicked off the mountaintops and, and go locally extinct? So there's another long-term project in the making, but at least we have the, uh, the data from 50 years ago in order to be able to understand what are the changes that are going on. Um, you heard uh, in uh, Diana's talk about the importance of floral resources. Uh, what we've looked at here uh, is a paper in which Zach was a co-author um, uh, at three different species of bumblebees, short, medium, and long-tongued bumblebee species. And they are all affected by precipitation and snowmelt date, and also by how many floral days are there, how many floral resource resources are there, measured as either floral days or total number of flowers. But one important point to make is that they're not all responding the same way to those variables. So it makes it difficult to generalize and say, oh, here's what bumblebees are doing. Here's what's happening to bumblebees. We have to be a little bit more specific and say, here's what's happening to Bombus apositus, uh, Bombus flavifrons, or uh, Bombus bifarius. 
I mentioned earlier that the growing season is getting longer. Here's another graph that shows that. If you look at the mean number of flowers plotted against day of year for an early time period in blue and a later time period in, in red there. And you can see that the season is starting earlier, it's going later. And as uh, there are also two peaks of flowering and they're getting pulled further apart, which means that there's now a growing low point for floral resources in the middle of the season, which is when all the bumblebees need the food for feeding their babies and the hummingbirds need the food for feeding their babies. So we're a little concerned about, about that uh, change, historical change that's, that's ongoing. One of the nice things about working at a field station is there are lots of potential collaborators studying other species which may interact with the ones that you're studying. And Dr. Carol Boggs, who's at University of South Carolina, had a, a nine-year data set for mark recapture a study of the populations of this um, uh, checker spot butterfly. And she uh, couldn't figure out why they were so variable. So she hadn't published those. And she mentioned this to me. And she told me a little bit about their biology. It turns out the, uh, the females of this species, uh, how many eggs they can make is determined by how much nectar they collect as adults, not floral resources, uh, uh, caterpillars uh, eating and storing up energy. Um, and so uh, this is a frost sensitive species. Uh, if you have less snowpack, the snow melts earlier, you get fewer flowers because most of the buds get frosted. And so uh, by putting our two data sets together, we are able to show that 84% of the variation in the butterfly population growth rate is explained by that variable of flower abundance and a little bit by direct effects of frost on caterpillars. So more flowers, more eggs, more butterflies the next year. And as we see decreasing snowpack and warmer springs and earlier snowmelt, we see more frost damage and that's gonna make fewer flowers with less nectar. And the next year there'll be fewer butterflies. So here's another story that we couldn't have figured out if we didn't have essentially decades of data for, for both of those partners. Uh, in terms of flowering phenology, we have species that start early, species start, that start late. One hypothesis is that all the community is going to maintain its same relationship and just get shifted earlier as snow melts earlier. But it's more complicated than that. What we're actually seeing is that some species are more affected than others. Uh, some flower for shorter periods, some flower for longer periods than they used to. So creating a new community of floral resources that these pollinators have to adapt to. And uh, in terms of bumblebees, solitary bees, flies, butterflies, and hummingbirds, uh, those poor floral abundance days explain for uh, out of 11 of the 13 species, uh, the declines that we're seeing, that there's a significant decline in, in uh, floral abundance days, and that's uh, in turn gonna affect all those groups of pollinators. And it looks like snow melt date is actually the most important variable there, not as important as temperature, not as important as uh, summer precipitation. So snow melt date is affecting, uh, explaining declines in 11 of 13 species that we studied. So annual variation at this altitude is huge. Uh, it takes decadal studies and long-term funding uh, to, to study that. And it's difficult to generalize across pollinator species. So I can't give you a short, quick answer for how pollinators are gonna be affected. Uh, climate change is affecting the floral resources, both in terms of their uh, the time of year when they're available and their abundance. Um, and managed ecosystems, we've heard a little bit about those, but they may offer better opportunities for adaptive management, uh, but natural ecosystems like these wildflower meadows uh, in the Gunnison National Forest, uh, not a lot of, of management opportunities there. Although uh, global political solutions have been almost impossible to achieve, there are some signs of growing support on local projects. We've heard some uh, positive stories about some of the things that are being done around the country, around the world with regard to pollinators. And I'll just close by saying NAPSI helps to build support for these measures that are needed to affect pollinators, uh, to protect pollinators. And so uh, thanks to all of you for serving as NAPSI members. Be happy to answer some questions. Thanks so much, David. And we do have time for uh, one quick in house question and one online question. I'm just scanning the room. Oh, right here. Uh, I can imagine uh, with the phenology mismatch 
that some generalists would fare better than specialists and that perhaps some specialists would do quite well because they would match particularly well and, and adapting to that. But do we have any data on, on that? Uh, in this environment, most of the species are, are, are generalists, more generalists than specialists. And so uh, uh, hopefully they're not going to run into those problems that could arise, as, you, as you've pointed out. Uh, but as these communities uh, resort themselves phenologically, uh, it's going to be interesting to, to to get an answer to that question. How do the generalists do versus specialists? All right, and we do have one question from our online uh, attendees. Uh, are there similar latitudinal and altitudinal shifts in plant species that were found in the Bombas? Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been keeping as close track of altitudinal migrations of, of the wildflowers as I have of the, the insects. We do know, however, that um, some of the species of wildflowers that were common back in the 1970s at lower altitudes have disappeared from those lower altitudes uh, sites. Uh, we don't know, uh, we don't have in, as much information about whether they're moving up in altitude. Uh, most of these plants at this altitude are long-lived perennials, uh, so those kinds of shifts are going to take uh, decades uh, but uh, unfortunately, that's something I wish I'd started keeping track of uh, 50 years ago, but <laughs> not so much. Are there any more questions? No, we're good. Okay, I'll be around, so feel free to come up and ask questions later. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, David. So. Um, I wanted to thank everyone, pardon me, on behalf of everyone at NAPSI and give a huge thanks to all of our presenters and everyone who asked questions. We're grateful for the valuable information and insights that these presentations provide to our Keystone session for our 23rd annual meeting. As a quick reminder, if you did have questions that were not answered, you can always email them to NAPPC at pollinator.org and we'll be sure to answer your question um, and pass it along to the appropriate speaker. So now this concludes the free public session of our conference. We hope that you all had a wonderful time, but we will ask those that have not paid for the full registration to leave the Zoom meeting now. And again, thank you so much for joining us. For NAPSI members, we're now going towards a short break and we'll start back again at um, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Thank you.